Good evening. This is Chairwoman Tierra Booker Dwyer. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, August 13th, 2024. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Ms. Chika Kalu. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being broadcast through the BCPS online live meeting broadcast and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the August 13th agenda. Dr. Rogers, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I'm unaware of any changes to this evening's agenda. The, the agenda stands. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and to consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The closed session summary and open session information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. At the board's meeting on June 11, 2024, and July 23, 2024, technology was inoperable and video minutes are unavailable. Although at an Education Transparency Act description and written minutes were posted within 72 hours of each meeting, neither set of mi minutes has been approved as is contemplated by our parliamentary authority, Robert's Rule of Orders, newly revised. Board members, are there any corrections to the minutes of June 11, 2024? Hearing none, the minutes of June 11, 2024 are approved as written and posted. Next, are there any corrections to the minutes of July 23, 2024? Hearing none, the minutes of July 23, 2024 are approved as written and posted. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that I call on Mr. McCall. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. I'd like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and leave. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 and through E3? So moved, so Tim moved Tim Harvey. Do I have a second? Second, Tim Pong. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frenpong? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chika Kalu? Yes. Ms. Dulewski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Thank Motion you. carries. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Director, Office of Mathematics, Coordinator, Literacy, Secondary, Department of Literacy and Humanities. Assistant Principal, Lansdowne Middle School. Fiscal Supervisor 3, Grants, Office of Grants Accounting. Supervisor, Office of Career, College and Technical Education. Specialist, Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervention Services, 
comprehensive support team, specialist, Office of Early Childhood, specialist, English Language Development, Department of Multilingual Achievement, and senior community school facilitator, Office of Title I, Homeless Programs and Community Schools. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in Exhibit F1? So move to go up, please. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Mr. Young? Yes. <coughs> Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frampong? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Mr. Kukulu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes, motion carries. Turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Our first appointment this evening is Lisa Balmage. Lisa, please stand. <laughs> Lisa is attending this evening with her current principal, Steve Coco from Mays Chapel Elementary School and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the principal at Harford Hill Elementary School. With 18 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include instru instrumental music teacher at Logan Elementary and White Oak Schools, math resource teacher at White Oak School, stat teacher at Norwood Elementary School, and assistant principal at Mays Chapel and Pedonia International Elementary School. Her prior experiences include vocal and instrumental music teacher in Broward County Public Schools and instrumental music teacher at Howard County Public Schools. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Madison Bressler. <laughs> Madison is attending this evening and is being appointed as the Fiscal Supervisor 3 Grants in the Office of Grant Accounting. Her previous experiences include staff accountant at Park Circle Investment Firm, staff accountant, senior accountant and controller at Allstate Leasing at Mile One Auto Group, and accounting manager at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. Congratulations and welcome to DCPS. <laughs> Our next appointment is Daniel Cheney. <laughs> Daniel is attending this evening with his sister Erica and is being appointed as the specialist in the Office of Early Childhood. With eight years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Daniel's DCPS experiences include paraeducator in the, the Department of Special Education, and special education inclusion teacher and special education self-contained teacher at Campfield Early Learning Center. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Rachel Goisevich. Rachel. <laughs> Rachel is attending this evening with her daughter Isabel and is being appointed as the coordinator literacy secondary in the Department of Literacy and Humanities. With 17 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include English teacher at Dundalk High and Delaney High Schools, resource teacher in the Department of Academics, and specialist disciplinary literacy in the Department of Literacy and Humanities. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Cynthia Greenberg. <laughs> Cynthia is attending this evening with her current principal, Rob Covert from Hereford High School and her close friend, Nicole Bridges, and is being appointed as the director in the Office of Mathematics. With seven years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Cynthia's DCPS experiences include math teacher at Towson High School and assistant principal at Hereford High School. Cynthia's prior experiences include math teacher in Pinellas County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> in case you can't tell, CNI is very excited this evening. <laughs> Our next appointment is Emmanuel Givares. Givares. Number two. Okay. Emmanuel is attending this evening with his wife, Natalie Suarez, and is being appointed as the specialist English language development in the Department of Multilingual Achievement. His previous experiences include English teacher and conversational English teacher in Puerto Rico and ESOL teacher and English language development resource teacher in Montgomery County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to BCPS.
Our next appointment is Rachel Hardesty. <laughs> Rachel is attending this evening with her mother, Melinda, and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the assistant principal at Woodmore Elementary School. With 10 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Rachel's experiences include classroom teacher at Scotts Branch Ele Elementary School and special education inclusion teacher at Scotts Branch Elementary and Woodmore Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Rebecca Hausman. <laughs> Rebecca is attending this evening with her husband, Rain Hausman, and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the specialist English language arts school improvement in the Department of Literacy and Humanities. With 15 years of experience with BCPS, her prior experiences include classroom teacher at Pine Grove Elementary School and consulting teacher at Shady Spring Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Stephen Jasper. Stephen is attending this evening with his wife, Claire, and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the assistant principal at Scotts Branch Elementary School. With 24 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his previous experiences include classroom teacher at Randallstown Elementary and Millbrook Elementary, classroom teacher, resource teacher, technology integration teacher, and stat teacher at Pleasant Plains Elementary School, and resource teacher and classroom teacher at Lyons Mill Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Shakia Johnson. <laughs> Shakia is attending this evening with her mother, Tamisha, and is being appointed as the Senior Community School Facilitator in the Office of Title I Homeless Programs and Community Schools. Her previous experiences include one-on-one -on -one in Worcester County Public Schools, family service assistant in Worcester County Judy Center, and community program coordinator in Wacomico County Public Schools. Congratulations and welcome to BCPS. <laughs> Our next appointment is Katherine Kent. Catherine is attending this evening with her husband, David Kent, at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as specialist mathematics in the Office of Math. Her experiences include mathematics teacher in Orange County, Fulton County, Fridland, Princeton City, and Howard County Public Schools, mathematics teacher in Fisco Independent School District, special education teacher at Calvin Academy, and manager of school partnerships at Carnegie Learning. Congratulations and welcome to BCPS. Michaela Koch. <laughs> Michaela is attending this evening with her husband Daniel at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the assistant principal at Lions Mill Elementary School. With 22 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include English teacher at Stemmers Run Middle, Dumbarton Middle, and Ridgely Middle Schools, and assistant principal at Ridgely Middle School. Congratulations. Our next appointment is Terry Lewis. <laughs> Terry Lewis is attending this evening with her daughter, Kaylin Lewis, a rising senior at Milford Mill, and was appointed <laughs> and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the assistant principal at Lyons Mill Elementary School. With 25 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include classroom teacher at Old Fort Middle, Newtown Elementary, Randallstown Elementary, and Woodholm Elementary Schools, reading teacher at Old Fort Middle School, English teacher at Southwest Academy, Pikesville Middle School, and Northwest Academy of Health Sciences, staff development teacher at Deep Creek Middle School, and consulting teacher at Lyons Mill Elementary School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Erica Lundy. Erica Lundy is attending this evening with her father, Eric Lundy, and mother, Carolyn Lundy, 
in spirit and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the principal at Edmondson Heights Elementary School. With 12 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include kindergarten teacher, classroom teacher, and resource teacher at Edmondson Heights Elementary School, and assistant principal at Hawthorne Elementary and Lyons Mill Elementary School. So from assistant principal of the year, elementary to principal, congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Catherine Rice. Catherine is attending this evening and is being appointed at the, as the assistant principal at Lansdowne Middle School. With eight, years, with eight years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her previous experiences include mathematics teacher at General John Stricker Middle School and staff development teacher at Stemmers Run Middle School. Prior to that, she served as a math and reading resource teacher in the District of Columbia Public Schools, teacher at Guahan Academy Charter School, and elementary teacher in Fairfax County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Brandon Thompson. Brandon is attending this evening with his wife, Charlie Thompson, and son, Legend Thompson, and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the assistant principal at Sparrows Point Middle School. With 10 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, his prior experiences include social studies teacher at Dundalk Middle and Pikesville Middle Schools. Prior to that, he was a social studies teacher at Hartford County Public Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Marcus Wimberly. <laughs> Marcus is attending this evening and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the Student Conduct Hearing Officer in the Office of School Climate and Culture. Welcome. With 21 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, your previous experiences include classroom teacher at Sparks Elementary School and Halstead, Halstead Academy resource teacher in the Office of Student Support Services, and pupil personnel worker in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Harry Wujek. <laughs> Harry is attending this evening with his wife, Ashley, and his principal, Yolanda Booker, from Hollibird Middle School and was appointed at the July 23rd Board of Education meeting as the assistant principal at Hollibird Middle School. With 10 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Harry's experiences include mathematics teacher and community school facilitator at Hollibird Middle School. Congratulations. <laughs> Our next appointment is Ruth Acker. She is watching virtually from home. Ruth is being appointed as a supervisor in the Office of Career, College, and Technical Education. With 25 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, Ruth's experiences include middle school teacher and technology education teacher at Catonsville Middle School, technology education teacher at Chesapeake High School, <coughs> science teacher and technology education teacher at Sollers Point Technical High School, and resource teacher in the Office of Career, College, and Technical Education. Congratulations, Ruth. <laughs> Our final appointment for the evening is Brandy Zellhofer, watching virtually as well. Brandy is being appointed as the Specialist Comprehensive Coordinated Early Intervention Services in the Office of Early Childhood. With 10 years of service with Baltimore County Public Schools, her experiences include special education, self-contained teacher, and social emotional learning teacher at White Oak School. Congratulations, Brandy. <laughs> Congratulations to all of our appointments. Thank you, and congratulations to you all. I know you're gonna do wonderful things for Baltimore County Public Schools. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the, opportunity the board, opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. If not selected to address the board, members of the public may submit their comments to the board via email at boe at bcps.org. 
The Baltimore County Police Department's Homeland Security Unit and Office of School Safety has recommended safety and security protocols which are posted in the boardroom and available in board docs and on the board's participation by the public website. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. Inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior, such as language that promotes violence against a BCPS employee or that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order and will not be tolerated. Persons who, who otherwise disrupt or disturb this meeting will not be allowed to continue their remarks and will be escorted from the meeting. Please observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time or prior to that at the discretion of the board chair. We will begin our public comment with our nonprofit community groups. And for that, I call Ms. Cole from the Baltimore County Education Justice Table. Hello, Ms. Cole. Hi. It's a busy night. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, happy to see you at the end, beginning of the school year, I guess. Um, I'm Nikki Cole with the Baltimore. Oh, I'm so sorry. I always forget to do this. Good evening, Dr. Rogers. <laughs> Chair Booker Dwyer um, and Christina Pumphrey and everyone amazing with the Baltimore County Public School Board. Good to see your faces. Um, I'm Nikki Cole, uh, representing the Baltimore County Education Justice Table. I know that you've uh, heard me speak before and other folks. Um, the last school board meeting was really busy, so all of us didn't get to testify um, to brief you about our uh, wish list. So um, I will reshare that with all of you, but just wanted to uh, talk about two points today. Um, we just humbly request, again, that the school board consider creating a policy that would define and clarify what community schools are to help make it transparent um, for all the administrators and all the educators who are a part of implementing uh, that, that new amazing model. Um, we've been hearing from a lot of people that it would benefit them and they, they would like to uh, see that. Um, and then additionally, I know that you all have concerns. We always have concerns about funding. How are we gonna fund something so big, so transformative, when politics at the state and the federal level always dictate how much we get, right? Um, so we're not here to contend that that's gonna be a challenge. Uh, we just want to be um, creative um, in how we resource, uh, not just community schools, but any of the initiatives that need to be, right? So, um, I had been talking with a couple of school board members that uh, maybe there's way we can do some additional fundraisers. Maybe we can contract with a capital campaign firm. Um, Maryland has a lot of really wealthy people that deeply believe in education, including here in Baltimore County. Maybe we can do some wealth screening, right? And like do some strategic resource mobilization um, in various communities or for the whole county to get what we need. Um, I don't and I'm not saying it is to um, agitate y'all on how to do your jobs. I'm sure maybe you have thought of this, just getting it on the public record um, and also thinking creatively about what other additional capacity grants there may be. Um, just exploring all levels, wanna be creative partners with y'all. Um, that's really it for today. Thank you so much for your time and appreciate all of your leadership. Thank you, Ms. Cole. Next, we will go to our individual citizens or students and our first speaker is Miss Saroff. Good evening everyone. Our school year is fast approaching and I am very concerned about the services that our students with disabilities will be receiving, or should I say not receiving. 
the summer's uh, ESY services to many students was appalling. Many students did not have the support required on their IEP because the support assigned to an entire school was a support of one. That's not appropriate. In some instances, some students were assigned to inappropriate classrooms. You simply cannot take a child from a behavior learning support class and dump them in a general education classroom. That's what was going on this summer. That is not acceptable. That is not ESY. IEPs are legal documents. They're not menus in a restaurant. We cannot continue to pick and choose what we want to follow and what we don't want to follow. I am hearing from teachers and parents and students themselves that their IEPs are not being followed, that they're not getting the proper support. And administrators are telling parents, oh, but we have the support. Again, one person in a whole school building does not equal proper support. And that's what I was seeing this summer in a number of the elementary schools, the middle schools across the county. I'm also going to bring up the fact that 504s are not being followed either, particularly in the middle school. They are being ignored and parents' rights, if parent asks for an IEP meeting, they can't get it. I'm not asking you to make my job go away. I'm asking you to do your job because I'm doing mine. This needs to be fixed. I applaud inclusion but dumping kids in a general education classroom without supports needed is not the way we do it. Thank you, Ms. Harrell. Our next speaker is Dr. Ferrone. evening to all of you. Um, do you know why the public does not donate to the school system beyond taxes like they do to GBMC, St. Joseph, etc.? I think because school administration does not really answer the public questions, concerns, emails. Because the public cannot really speak directly to you and to the superintendent. Now kudos for you, Dr. Rogers, for mingling with the new teachers, but I think the school system from the top down needs to communicate with the media and with the public like myself. There are other reasons that I see. There is a focus on appeasing special interest rather than really to focus on the quality of education. And the instance of that and others, uh, as you know, that in last meeting, um, I was ejected out for standing up and recording a video of the board in heated discussion, while many other people do the same, including today, some of the people in the in back behind me were taking videos and standing up and making noise and so forth. So what I read is that the guidelines for security given to you are guidelines. You are supposed to apply them using what's appropriate, what's common sense and what is wise to apply. And I don't really see that. 
the board is, and the school system is supposed also to revise those security guidelines as you go. Standing up to stretch the legs in a four hour meeting like July 9th or to relieve pain in or to get circulation better or standing up to take a video of an interesting discussion to advertise for it and for you, the school system on my Facebook, is not a crime, is not something wrong to do. I think item number, uh, number four, for you, the board, is you are committed for community engagement. I really don't think you are committed to community engagement if you don't answer your emails. Thank you, Dr. Farron. Since we have speaker space left, we will go to our next individual citi citizen, Ms. Ms. Bergman. Good evening, board members. I'm back. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Rogers. You look beautiful and wonderful up there. I am so excited as a former parent from BCPS. I came today to report back. I got the opportunity to go across the nation all the way to the next coast. And I have to say, the quality of education that Baltimore County provides to our students is top notch. Top notch. My children suffered the last two years in California. Smaller school districts in California, limited funding. When they went to hire teachers and educators that we needed, they had vacancy after vacancy after vacancy. Obviously, we don't see here. It's still tough. It's still rough out there. We have a shortage in education to, to be able to support the kids and the needs that they need. And it's going to be great. Um, back in 2009, one of my children was diagnosed on the autism spectrum, and it was one out of 110 children that needed special education support. 2018, we have one out of 36 children. That's the size of most of our classrooms. And the one of the most challenging thing is not just hiring warm bodies to educate children that need special attention to have these tremendous challenges but to be able to have quality people provide a quality education. And I know a lot of people want to give Baltimore County a hard time. Ah, we're not doing enough in Maryland. We're not doing enough in Maryland. Well, you know what? If you leave Maryland, you go elsewhere, you're going to see how much we're doing in Baltimore County. Because the quality of service and education that we're providing children is absolutely uh, amazing. My children are both like, Mom, can we go back to Maryland? Can we go back to Maryland? We're not learning enough here the curriculum, the quality of teaching. You know, I work in special education in the school district over there in California, and we had substitute teachers for teaching special education class, and they would quit on the spot. I had a principal ask me, come teach. I'm like, I'm not credential in your state. So to have warm bodies, quality teachers, quality educators that have a history, we're doing something right. As hard as times are, Baltimore County is doing something right. The state of Maryland is one of the very few states in the nation that prioritize education. And I know that from not just as a parent having students in BCPS, I know that because I was a former team BCPS team member. I worked in the Office of, of World Language. And that's, th that's what I'm really concerned about, children with their language barriers, make sure they're getting their special education needs. So keep doing and doing your absolute best because the kids and the families in Baltimore County, this is what we need and we are doing it right. Keep going in that direction. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Bergman. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report and for that I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, members of the board. I'm pleased to provide an update uh, for the month of August as a part of my report. First thing is I want everybody to know that it has been an incredibly busy summer. Um, even though the 111,000 students 
have uh, left us for a short period of time. Uh, staff members across Team BCPS have been working throughout the summer to prepare for the return in students, which is in less than two weeks. This slide, I'm not gonna review everything. This slide uh, depicts just some of the work that has been happening across divisions, across offices. A lot of work around content and pedagogy, professional learning for our teachers, our teacher leaders, our administrators, our central office leaders um, has been taking place making sure that we're providing new educator orientation, which the kickoff began yesterday. We had 679 new educators attend uh, that orientation. Um, more that we had facilities, capital projects at 61 schools with another 21 additional special projects. So the work of facilities, uh, maintenance, logistics is ongoing. We're excited to open two brand new schools in two weeks an elementary school and a middle school, reviewing the grading and reporting processes. Uh, the feedback that we received from our stakeholders uh, made us prioritize this, and so we're excited about some new guidance that's coming out to our families over the next two weeks. Our summer uh, meals program fed more than, uh, provided more than 42,000 meals and uh, for our families, including our rural new program that was at Kingsville and Sparks Elementary Schools. Uh, budget training for central office leaders as well as principals, a new principal and new assistant principal academy. We're excited this Saturday at our BCPS Fest. We're gonna have a vaccination clinic for the first time ever because we want all of our students in class, in school, on time on August 26th. A new social media work group um, to really focus on the impact of social media in our schools and how we can um, help our uh, staff and students with that. Our partnership fair this year had more than um, 80 partners. I believe we had 86 partners um, attend the partnership fair and curriculum writing that occurred this summer. Um, we had five different hiring events. I would be remiss if I didn't highlight this with more than 490 attendees, and this will be important in one of the um, upcoming slides. Uh, just really wanted everyone to have an opportunity to um, see and understand some of the work that is taking place during the summer um, across Team BCPS and really just thank all of our Team BCPS staff members uh, who have been working night and day to make sure that we provide better conditions for all of our students. This next slide is a staffing update, staffing update number four. As of today, we have 126.6 FTE vacancies. Same date last year, we had 295 vacancies. Um, we, if you take a look at that um, chart, you will see that uh, we are more than 98% fully staffed as a school system, the highest that we've been in years. Uh, 101 of our schools um, have two vacancies or less. I'm sorry, 101 of our schools have zero vacancies and 159 of our schools have two or fewer vacancies. And so we're really excited about this work that's happening in human resources and in schools. Um, we have even partnered with the uh, radio station, iHeartRadio, as well as uh, television station to run um, commercials. And we are going to put in a shameless plug, take 30 seconds and run the video for anyone who's watching this board meeting. <laughs> if you too would like a position in BCPS, come on down. Attention. Are you looking to make a difference in the lives of our children? Baltimore County Public Schools wants you. Well, I've been a teacher now for 19 years, and I love every day of my job. I love working with children. I've had opportunities to leave the classroom, and I just can't. If you're a recent grad or a teacher looking to relocate or maybe changing careers and teaching is your new passion, Baltimore County Public Schools is eager to talk to you. For more information, contact us and experience the benefits of BCPS. Attention. Are you so that work remains ongoing, and um, it, it, 
responding to uh, one of the comments about engaging, engaging is not a one and done thing for us as Team BCPS. In the same way that last year we engaged throughout the year with all of our stakeholders face to face as well as uh, in writing through a variety of surveys, that work is going to continue. Only with your feedback are we able to implement the changes that we need to in real time. And so on our website, our families can already find our Back to BCPS page with all of the information that they need um, to make sure that students are ready to come back to school. I think I said it before, August 26th, that's our first day, as well as we will be posting the strategic community engagement opportunities that really share all of the opportunities throughout the year when myself and members of my team will be out and about really engaging with members of Team BCPS so we can stay connected and do this important work. And lastly, the first day of school is August 26th. Um, we continue to look at our enrollment numbers. We're so excited. We see preschool numbers rising already. We have some of our kindergarten friends that we need you to register. And so if you are watching and you have a neighbor that has a five-year-old or a four-year-old, uh, please encourage them to go right to our website. It's the front banner. Uh, with one click, they'll find all the information that they need right at their fingertips. If the uh, website is too difficult to navigate, we encourage you to just call your neighborhood school right away um, to schedule a meeting and someone will walk you through the process. We're really excited about our students returning um, and experiencing high quality teaching and learning in all of our schools. And so with that, um, thank all of you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. We are looking forward to the start of the school year, and I will uh, begin with the chair's report. And, and that is the first line in my chair's report. We are looking forward to the start of the new school year. We are welcoming new, team, new and returning team members to BCPS. And as the school year starts, the board, we are preparing to engage in a retreat led by the Maryland Association of, board of, of Boards of Education. As part of this retreat, we are beginning to finalize our internal accountability structures, and we're gonna share that with the public at an upcoming board meeting. Right now, the public mostly sees us in, in these open sessions, but there are, there's so much that happens. Um, we are in the community, we are at professional learning events, we go on school visits, we are engaged in, in meetings and um, committee meetings, and we wanna make that very transparent to the public to know that all that work that we are doing outside of these meetings that you see us in is helping to inform our governance, governance structure. And so um, we are looking forward to a, a much more transparent uh, process with the board um, so, that you, so that we can hold ourselves account accountable as we are holding the school system accountable. And a call for the parents, please remember to join your local area education advisory council. This council, they advise us, they provide information to us to inform our decisions. And so um, every area has an advisory, uh, an advisory council. So please join and be active in those councils as the school year starts because it really does help to inform overall board governance. And at this time, I'll turn it over to our student board member, Ms. Chika Kalu, for her uh, report. Good evening, Superintendent Rogers, Board Chair Brooker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, board members, staff, community members, and of course, students of BCPS. I am honored to deliver my second board report as a 24 to 25 student member of the board. This past month has been a whirlwind, but incredibly fulfilling nonetheless, filled with meaningful opportunities to advocate for our students, engage with the community, and lay the groundwork for a productive and impactful school year. I'm eager to share the strides I've made and, I'll like and outline the work that lies ahead as we continue to strive for excellence. In July, I had the in July, I had the incredible opportunity to attend the American Civil Liberties Union National Advocacy Institute on a full scholarship. This experience deepened my understanding of civil liberties and social justice as I engaged with civil rights attorneys, youth advocates, Kamal Bell, and many other inspiring individuals. One of the most impactful moments was lobbying on Capitol Hill for policy S1809, the Kids Online Safety Act. During this time, I met with Representative Raskins and the staff of Senator Chris Van Hollen, where we advocated for critical revisions to ensure it truly protects marginalized communities who view online spaces as essential for disseminating information. 
This policy has the potential to significantly impact how, long, how young people interact, and I am proud to have contributed to this conversation. I also had the pleasure of visiting the Woodlawn Middle School Summer Site and the Cannonsville Multilingual Learning Center. These visits were eye-opening and allowed me to witness firsthand the dedication of our educators and the resilience of our students who dedicated 20 days of their summer for over four hours a day to further their education. Hearing from educators and students offered a unique experience different from the academic year, providing valuable insights into how these programs are most essential in offering additional support and resources to students who need them the most. These visits also highlighted areas where our programs can improve to better meet students' needs. And moving forward, I am excited about seeing such initiatives throughout the year and hoping to expand them to ensure that all students, regardless of their background or circumstances, have access to the tools they need to succeed. One of the cornerstones of my role as SMOB is to ensure that student voices are at the forefront of our decision-making processes. Over the past month, I've engaged in numerous discussions with students to hear what they seek most. These conversations have been especially important in shaping my priorities and ensuring that my efforts align with the needs and desires of our student body. Whether through informal discussions, town halls, or our upcoming meetings with the Board of Selected Students, alongside the BCSC Vice President, Forsyth Ogumbe, I'm committed to maintaining an open line of communication with my peers, ensuring that their voices are not just heard, but acted upon. In my role within the Baltimore County Student Council, I've been serving on both the officer team and the executive board. We are, actively, we are actively working to ensure a productive and successful school year. We have an upcoming executive board retreat, and with many initiatives in the work, I am excited to soon serve updates ab as they are finalized. In preparation for the new academic year, I am working closely with BCPS TV to develop and launch back-to-school campaigns and videos. These campaigns aim to foster a sense, of, a sense of community and excitement as we near a new academic journey. My goal is to ensure that every student feels welcome, supported, and inspired as they return to school, while also reaching every corner of our student population to inform them about the role of the SMOB and introduce myself as their representative this year. Yesterday, I attended the Maryland Association of Board of Education new, stu new Student Board Member Orientation, where I gained valuable tools and knowledge to navigate the complexities of board governance and increase my involvement regarding Maryland state, legis state ed legislation pertaining to education. I'm also excited to share that I will serve as a student panelist during MABE's annual retreat in October, where I will further advocate for student perspectives and provide Board of Education members with student voice in our conversations. As a member of the Maryland Association of Student Councils Executive Board, I attended the MASC Advance, a three-day retreat where we gathered to receive our workshop presenter certifications and engage with student leaders across the state. Our discussions focused on how to effectively communicate our goals and missions to enhance student voice voices across Maryland. One of the most exciting outcomes of this orientation is the collaboration I have begun with the state's mob, Abby Gotham. Together, we are developing a workshop for the Fall Leadership Conference titled Working with Adults as a Student Leader. This workshop will address the unique dynamics that student leaders face when interacting with adults, offering strategies for effective communication, advocacy, and leadership. I'm extremely excited to bring the insights from these meetings back to BCPS and collaborate with student leaders in our district. In addition to my collaborations with Avi, I've been actively connecting with SMOBs from other districts across the county. These connections with over 20 Maryland SMOBs have provided me with a wealth of perspectives and ideas that I'm eager to integrate into our work here in BCPS. One specific action I will be taking is attending the Carroll County, Carroll County Board Meeting, which is tomorrow, where I will speak there in public comment as an individual to advocate for increased student board representation and rights for student board members. In Carroll County, the student representative on the board who has yet to be recognized as a full colleague or member only has the power of an honorary vote, which is contingent on the approval of other board members. Additionally, they are not allowed to have a student advisory council or conduct stu school visits, critical aspects of effectively serving as a student board member and representing students' needs. It is only because of the collective efforts of past mobs, such as Christian Thomas, Rowa Hassan, Haluma Adekoya, Omer Rashid, and many others that I have the privilege of sitting here today as a voting member, even on budgetary matters, a privilege many SMOBs across the state do not have. However, this privilege is not meaningful if I do not use it to advocate for my fellow student board members. I'm committed to uplifting and strengthening our community of SMOBs across the street, state, ensuring that students from all regions of Maryland, not simply Baltimore County, are heard. While the journey to securing full rights and representation for all SMOBs across Maryland will be long, I, alongside my fellow SMOBs, am ready and prepared to champion this cause and pass along the torch of change. By building a network of student leaders, we aim to amplify our voices and work collaboratively towards common goals. So as we move forward, my focus remains on fulfilling the promises I made to BCPS students during my campaign. 
These include working to ensure every student, regardless of their background, has the resources they need to thrive, supporting BCPS as we enhance and evaluate student mental health support, recognizing the unseen brilliance within our county, promoting our academic excellence, and fostering a school culture where students are seen as holistic individuals, not only academically. So in, in closing, I want to express my deepest gratitude to the board, the BCPS community, and most importantly, the students who have entrusted me with this responsibility once again. The work, we, the work I've done over this past month is just the beginning. As we continue to move forward, I'm committed to fulfilling my promise that every student's voice is heard and that every piece of the puzzle is valued and will be fully represented in my work on the board. Each piece, each voice is, is essential to our success. Thank you once again, and I truly cannot wait to see all of you in just two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Chika Kalu. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Ms. Devasti Jones. Good evening, members of the board. Uh, Dr. Rogers, earlier tonight the board met in closed session and took action on the following case, HE 24-26. Now would be an appropriate time for to confirm the action that was taken at that time by the board. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case 24-26 and authorize Ms. Gover to sign for those board members not physically present? So moved, Madam Paul. May I have a second? Second, Humphrey. Second, Harvey. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chika Kalu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the special project request for Baltimore Highlands Elementary School, and for that I call on Dr. Jones. Good evening, Board Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and Superintendent Dr. Rogers. I bring before you the consideration of a 7330 special project for Baltimore Highlands Elementary School. As always, our 7330 process is done in collaboration with Dr. Grimm, Chief Operating Officer, and his um, team in the Department of Facilities. Upon approval and in collaboration with the Baltimore County Foundation, Permission is being sought to plant a community garden with two locations at Baltimore Highlands Elementary School. The community garden will have one location which is in, in the fenced courtyard and all gardening will be organic methods with the use of, with, without the use of pesticides and herbicides. The second site will be outside of the gated area along the perimeter of the breezeway and this garden will consist of native grasses, shrubs and wildfires, wildflowers. Whew and will not require <laughs> any raised beds or changes to the landscape. Again, I bring before you for the recommended action of approval of the 7330 project for Baltimore Highlands Elementary School Community Garden. Do I have a motion to approve the privately funded 7330 project request for community garden at Baltimore Highlands Elementary School as presented in Exhibit L? So move Selesky. Do I have a second? Second, Savoy. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chika Kalu? Yes. Ms. Dulesky? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you on behalf Thank of the you. students at Baltimore Highlands Elementary School. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is contract awards, and for that I call on Mr. Young, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Members of the board, the board's Building and Contracts Committee met on Monday, August 12, 2024. Items M1 through M13 were forwarded to the board for full approval. Thank you, Mr. Young. Board members, are there any separation requests? Do I have a motion to approve items M1 through M13? So moved. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from committee. Any discussion? Ms. Frimpong. So I raised my hand. So I did have questions on M2, M8, and M10. What are your, so let's start with M2. What are your questions on M2? So for M2, this is the um, contract about the industry recognized certifications. Um, and so 
just was asking questions about the programs themselves. So which schools have these CTE programs? I mean, is it across the board and are they uniform as well across the board for these schools that have the programs? Lavita Parham is coming forward. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everyone. How are you? Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Sure, no worries. So I do see, I, s I read ahead, so I reviewed the presentation that you guys are doing, and I see that 70% of our students are earning these credentials. Um, but my question was about the programs themselves as far as which programs are incorporating the certifications and which schools have it. So is it a uniform thing across the schools? Mm -hmm. Every school that has a CTE program and has a an aligned, we call them industry recognized credential, IRC. So um, any program that has, any school that has the program will also have the certification aligned to it. So like we discussed, if it's a nursing program, it's going to have CNA or CCNA. If it's business, it's going to have Cert 40. So across the county, if we think about the different areas, like East, West, et cetera, yeah. we have that kind of, that representation of these programs and those certifications available across the county. Every school that offers a certification, offers a program, has a certification attached to it. Got it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Any other questions on M2? Well, thank you, Ms. Hall. Any more questions? Uh, what are your questions on M8? So M8 is our bottled water services, and not against the contract. Uh, the question just is, so this one is a five-year, $6 million, um, and it's for the 87 uh, public schools. So do we have a plan and timing to address those schools? Um, as far as the bottled water, the dispensers, and the coolers, so that it's not required? Or are we expecting in, thank you, in 2029 that we're going to spend, continue to spend? Because we've already done this as well for three years and four months, spending 3,000, or th I'm sorry, three, about 3 million. If I could start, and then Dr. Grimm will um, continue. Um, it, I'm sure Dr. Grimm will give you this. This was one of the ones that we always take a look at. He will give you the um, specifics in terms of, um, uh, you know, what changes have been made. This everybody has a historical context for where uh, the bottled water came from, uh, but uh, in the past, when there have been um, there has been strong support to keep the bottled water in schools. I guess that's the shortest way that I can put it. Um, if this uh, board want to indicate otherwise, you know, we're, we're certainly open to receive that uh, feedback. But there has been historical, very strong support to keep the bottled water in schools. We do have some schools that have the filters with the bottle fillers um, and things of that nature. But there, there's also um, deep history of keeping the water bottles in schools. Uh, but Dr. Grimm, if you want to speak to uh, the technical aspects or anything that I've missed, please do so. Certainly, so good evening, Ms. Rempong and members of the board. Um, so we are required by the state, as you know, to test all of our water. Cur presently, we have 87 of our school facilities that do not meet the acceptable level at the state. Um, we are constantly monitoring that acceptable level. So why, while it was 87 in July, that number could drop or increase over the next, you know, next month, uh, six months from now, next year, as we as we go through the testing process, um, because there are a number of vari variables to the testing that are completed. Um, to be clear. It's not just those school 87 schools where we do provide bottled water. It is in all of those facilities where the, the principal deems it necessary or we don't have the technology in place, as Dr. Rogers said, where we've been able to, um, to install uh, filters and bottle fillers or they haven't been installed through grant projects or through other means. Um, so I, I hope that clarifies some of the parts of question. In terms of, of um, so fixing the problem, so to speak. Um, there are some facilities because they are um, on wells, for example, the, the type of treatment that we would have to do at the facility that we have 
um, would not be cost effective from the standpoint of drinking water versus water that, that is safe for you to wash your hands. Um, so there's a big difference there between treating all of the water and treating just what would be drinking water. Okay, you're welcome. Any other questions on M8? Ms. Gillespie. Thank you, just a very quick question. Has there been any interest or looking into any grants or sponsorships to just reduce the expense for the school system? Thank you. So that's a great question. We are, we are constantly looking for, <laughs> for those types of um, opportunities. Um, as Dr. Rogers alluded to in our, our new construction and in our new renovations, um, the bottle, the bottle, the filters with the water fillers are um, now standard. So you will you will see them in a, in a number of our newly constructed schools and in our renovated schools as well. Um, so that that's a key component. We're constantly looking for opportunities to be able to to upgrade some of those facilities. Um, in some cases, it's just really not cost effective. I know back when I was a principal, we got the bottle fillers in the school that, that I was at and it was really expensive to retrofit them and part of that was because we had some additional funding opportunities. Ms. Harvey? Oh, Ms. Gillespie, were you done uh, your question? You. Yeah, okay, yep, Ms. Harvey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanna just follow up on this um, retrofitting process and assessment. So is it the case that these 87 schools um, are not uh, scheduled to be retrofitted or have challenges with being retrofitted or is it a, an issue of funding, solely funding uh, to retrofit these schools with the bottle fillers um, as you were discussing earlier? And has there been consideration in terms of the the budget allocation to uh, plan on retrofitting those schools where it may not be as challenging as others while we continue to pursue grants and other funding options. Uh, so Ms. Harvey, thank you for your questions. I think, it, to it, please correct me if I don't hit all of them. Um, there is no current plan for the number of schools that we have to retrofit them. Um, what we what we do instead is as projects come online for the schools where this might be an issue, um, we incorporate that that process as as part of it. Um, but there is no standard plan across the system for um, for retrofitting them or, or for examining this particular issue. Um, it is very much a fun, a funding issue. Um, it is also in some cases a logistical issue, um, as I indicated or, or, or tried to convey, um, in some of our facilities, there is, there's ample water for um, washing hands, for flushing toilets, for other means that is absolutely safe. It's just not safe drinking water. Um, so to, to, to try and do something to mitigate um, just the drinking water may not be as cost effective as um, providing bottled water in some of those circumstances. So did I answer all of your questions, Ms. Harvey? I think you did. I just have one follow-up. So did I hear correctly that you said that there's consideration for installing the bottle fillers when there is uh, construction or, or renovations to an existing school that's receiving bottled water? Yes, ma'am. That's that's correct. And in actually, in 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 all in really all of our schools, since we have that availability, a good example is um, I believe Pine Grove Middle, which is currently under a, a significant renovation. I believe um, there are bottle fill bottle fillers in that facility. Um, I know for a fact in in Nottingham. I was just there last week. There's uh, bottle fillers there. So it's a part of our new construction. And as we're doing additions and renovations, we're also taking that in consideration. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions on M8? Ms. Frimpong, your questions on M10. M10, this is the, the playground equipment um, contract. And so the question is, is this for new or existing schools? Uh, so it is it is when we need a repla replacement equipment for our playground. So sometimes it's a full renovation and sometimes it is um, it is part of just we have 
um, playground equipment that needs to be replaced for whatever reason, and if it's part of a capital project, this is mainly capital, some of it's um, operating money as well, um, it comes through this contract. Okay, so then um, how is that prioritized? Because for example, in, when the advisories will meet in the fall and they do their budgets, a lot of times that's one of the things that comes up is the new playground. So how is that prioritized and are they, you know, is that information getting back to them so they know the playground is coming? So th thank you for your question, Ms. Frempong. So playgrounds are, um, are one of those issues, again, that are a little bit more uh, complex, I'll call it, than, than not. Um, oftentimes we are we are replacing equipment because it's unsafe. So it might be a, a, a slide or a, a pole or some other apparatus on the playground, or we have to do some other modification. Um, sometimes it's because the equipment has um, worn out its 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 safety lifespan. So we need to do a full um, replacement of it. Sometimes we get grant opportunities from um, our local and state politicians to be able to fund new or expanded playgrounds. Um, so it really all all depends. We do try to keep a list of of the playgrounds. They are inspected. I believe it's on a monthly basis. I'm gonna look at. Leslie, yes, um, she's our director of facilities construction and improvement. So uh, as part of those monthly assessments, um, our inspectors are, are making determinations if there's p parts or pieces that need to be replaced, and we try to schedule them in as best as possible with the funds that we have. So how sometimes much it's full and sometimes it's just partial. Mm -hmm. So how much, I guess, notice is that community given or whatever? So if there's a uh, unsafe playground mm -hmm. um, how much notice I guess is given to that school community like hey you're getting you're getting the playground well so the so the first the first step is if it's a safety issue is that we'll uh, we'll often close part that part of the playground or that part of the issue so it's not available to you know we mark it off or we take out that part of the equipment um, it depends on the type of project it is and it depends on the equipment um, I, I recently recall seeing um, uh, Maiden Choice just received some new uh, playground equipment. Um, they had a specialized uh, uh, chair swing or something. It, it, the lead time was something like three months just to order that, just to get in that piece of equipment. So we do try to communicate with the school and the community that something is on the schedule. Um, we also uh, try to update the board and our local politicians that work with us on through the grant project status update of, um, of when the larger projects are, are happening. Um, but sometimes if it's just a singular piece of equipment, we try to work with the, the principal at the local school level and let them know what the issue is gonna be. You're welcome. Any other questions on M10? Yes, Ms. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a comment. I wanna express my appreciation for the Nottingham uh, middle site and the fact that the playground was replaced for that community. You may think, why does a middle school site need a playground? But um, that playground um, had to be um, replaced to put the middle school on that site. And I know that the community will appreciate the fact that it was replaced um, in p as part of the construction of the new middle school site. So to whomever was involved in those decisions, that was much appreciated. It's a, it's a beautiful outdoor facility. It, the inside's beautiful as well. We're excited for you all to visit. Thank you. Any other questions on M10? Any questions on any other contract? May I have a roll call vote? Mr. Young? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Frempong? Yes. Ms. Lick, I'm sorry, Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Chikakalu? Yes. Ms. Valeski? Yes. Dr. Savoy? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Harvey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Motion carries. The next item on the agenda is the report on the proposed FY 2026 state capital budget request. And for that, I call on Dr. Grimm. I'm sorry, I wouldn't have gotten up. I'd forgotten who's <laughs> next. <laughs> Good evening, uh, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Superintendent Dr. Rogers, members of the board. I'm excited to be here this evening with um, 
Ms. Leslie Lazeri, our Director of Facilities Construction and Improvement. Um, Leslie is a longtime BCPS employee and she took over as director in the spring for Merrill Plate who retired after also long time service with, with BCPS. Uh, we're here this evening uh, just to share with you the FY 2026 uh, state capital budget. So we just have a couple slides to, to share with you regarding timelines and what have you. This slide provides the schedule for the FY 2026 state capital budget request. After tonight's introduction, there will be a board work session on August the 27th, followed by your vote on September the 10th. Next slide, please. This slide shows the priority order for the FY 2026 state capital budget, and that information has been posted in board docs and is publicly available. Next slide. Just as a reminder, this is separate from our county capital budget, and this slide depicts that schedule. That budget will not uh, be to you until December. You'll see that again in December. And finally, next slide, please. This is the FY 2025 capital budget that you approved as a board in January 2024, which shows the priority listing there. And thank you very much. Board members, please submit any questions you may have on the proposed FY 2026 state capital budget request to Dr. Rogers by Tuesday, August 20th, 2024, for discussion at the August 27th, 2024 board work session. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on budget, equitable resource allocation model, Title I, comprehensive support and improvement, targeted support and improvement, and community schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Thank you. Good evening again, uh, Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and members of the board. We are excited for our first budget report to the full board. The topic of this report is equitable resource allocation, really focusing on Title I, CSI, TSI, and community schools. Uh, this evening, we're joined by our Chief Financial Officer, Chris Hartlove, Director of Community Schools, Melissa Forster, and Director of Title I, TSI, CSI, and Homeless Program, Michelle Stansberry. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So we'll start with our strategic plan. Um, as we move forward with these budget presentations, uh, it is our goal to uh, really illuminate how these uh, specific presentations are a part of our infrastructure goal. Our goal as a school system to ensure that we have efficient and effective practices in how we are operating internally and externally is a priority of ours. Specifically, when we take a look at the blueprint, there are five pillars that all school systems, as you're aware, are called to move forward uh, no matter what the uh, fiscal landscape is. For today's presentation, we're focusing on pillar number four, more resources for students to be successful. As a reminder, this pillar requires all school systems to devote additional resources to students that demonstrate higher levels of need. This is a reminder of where we were as we were planning the FY25 fiscal budget. As everyone knows, the ESSER funds expire at the end of September, and as a large school system, uh, that was a significant amount for us. Um, as you see the items falling off of the cliff, these are critical investments that our schools system, uh, internal and external stakeholders told us that we needed to keep. Additionally, when we look at the rollout of the percentage of allocation for Blueprint for Maryland's future funding for schools, uh, this, this upcoming fiscal year or this current fiscal year has a much smaller percentage than what we have received uh, in the past and what we are slated to receive in the upcoming year. But even with that as the case, we still have a responsibility to all of our students. These maps you've seen before, these maps um, show us by level the percentage of students, the schools where we see pockets of economically disadvantaged students. And the gradations, the deeper reds 
um, indicate areas that are uh, where you find higher percentages, students that are in higher percentage of um, economic uh, need. And so uh, we see that for us across the school system, our areas of um, need are primarily resting in elementary, middle, and high schools in the, cent in the uh, west z and the eastern zones. So knowing that we had limited funds, one of our tasks was to still move forward with equitable resource allocation in our schools. We had to look at all of the funding sources that were available and how we could better use and better allocate funds to meet the needs of our students. And so this evening's presentation really speaks to grant funding that we have available and how we have changed uh, the way that we are uh, allocating those funds to meet the needs of students. When we talk about resource equity, we want to level set and make sure that everyone is clear that we're talking about how we allocate the use of resources, people, time, and money uh, to create student experiences across our school so that all children, they are able to uh, reach high outcomes, no matter what their race is, no matter what their outcome is. Um, specifically, we're looking at shifts in resources and with the new blueprint legislation, um, it is very specific in terms of the 75-25 uh, allocation, calling all school systems uh, to look at shifting resources to students who have higher needs. Um, our, what are our structures and practices that allow for all of our students, um, particularly those furthest from opportunity, to attend a school where they can learn and thrive? And we are really looking at how do we braid all of our resources together to create a high performing system for every school, every student uh, to ensure that they're ready for tomorrow. As everyone knows, our resources are primarily allocated in three ways. We first begin with enrollment. And I think that's particularly important because we need to underscore that all students will receive appropriate resources. And the way we do that is to make sure that we look at students and per pupil expenditures. Now levels two and three go above and beyond uh, the enrollment uh, formulas that we provide to staff schools. Level two is need, and that's what we'll focus on um, this evening, as well as programs. Needs when we're looking at the percentage of students who receive special education services, our multilingual learners, our students who are economically disadvantaged, those are three primary groups of need that all school systems are called to focus on when we're looking at resource allocation. And then number three, additional programs. Those additional programs may be academic, they can be career technology um, related, which we have a report on this evening, or um, they can be uh, programs that uh, serve and support schools like community schools, like Title I schools, um, ATSI and CSI. And so for the remainder of this uh, presentation, uh, we're going to get into what are those funding sources? How did we take a second look, a close, deeper look as a system of uh, approximately $91 million to identify how we were allocating those funds? So in the past, uh, where schools would receive a certain amount of funding and a school would create an individualized budget, um, we spent a lot of time and energy um, really focused on compliance, following the paperwork to make sure that we had that ready to um, submit to the state or the federal government depending on the funding source. Um, our new approach is to focus on what is directly going to meet the needs of students, what is evidence-based practice, bringing people directly into the classroom to support students in mathematics and literacy, and to provide you with a deep dive into the funding um, as well as all of the considerations for Title I um, and uh, community schools. The rest of the team will take it from here. Sure, uh, good evening uh, board members, uh, board chair Booker Dwyer, vice chair Pumphrey, um, as superintendent uh, Rogers uh, mentioned, we're talking about right now approximately $91 million in funding of, of the items that we're talking about tonight. Um, we're talking about Title I, uh, targeted uh, TSI funds, targeted uh, support and improvement, so additional uh, targeted support and, and, and uh, support and improvement. Comprehensive, comprehensive s support and improvement and community schools. And the first th 
three that I mentioned are all federal dollars, and then the last is uh, the community schools are state uh, dollars. As far as, as as far as how the funding is determined, uh, Title I is uh, schools can qualify for Title I funding if at least 40 percent of the students enrolled are from low-income families, and we get those counts. Those are the uh, October 31st uh, enrollment counts. Uh, for TSI or ATSI, the, uh, uh, these are schools that have one or more student groups that are consistently underperforming or, uh, or not meeting state established standards. The uh, CSI schools, uh, for those, we're looking at uh, schools that are in the bottom 5% of Title I schools or all schools having a graduate, uh, graduation rate of 67% or lower. And finally, uh, community schools, uh, this is based on poverty thresholds established by the Blueprint for Maryland's Future. There are two types of uh, concentration of poverty grants. There's the uh, personnel and the per uh, pupil um, grant. The uh, number of schools, Title I, there are 78. Um, ATSI, there are 48. Uh, CSI, there are 13. And community schools, we have 91. The, um, and then the dollar figures are um, uh, Estimated for, for FY25, approximately $49 million for Title I. A total over uh, multiple years of $6.3 million for um, ATSI and uh, CSI. And then uh, for community schools, we have $25 million in FY25 for personnel and uh, $9.6 for the per pupil. And the next slide is... Title I considerations. Thank you. So when thinking about this much funding, we really wanted to make sure that we were focusing on a way that schools got what they needed despite what they could afford. Um, as Dr. Rogers shared in the past, schools would get a Title I allocation, and then they would determine, can I afford one teacher, two teachers, one para, so on and so forth. And so that really wasn't fair because of fluctuations in the cost of staff particularly when you think about changes in insurance and benefit selections, as well as upgrades in salaries. And so while I may have been able to afford teacher A in year one, in year two, I can no longer afford it. This swap to how we are now allocating staffing takes that away from schools and allows us centrally to be able to fund all of the positions out of one pot. So what you see listed here are some considerations in what we took into account is we were allocating staffing to schools. We fund about 400 staff members, some paras, some teachers. We took first into account that Title I schools have high student mobility, and so we decided to use enrollment counts, of course this was dark, at the end of the school year. <laughs> because by that point, we would see that fluctuations in enrollment would change. We also did some comparisons back to September 30th enrollment, and we took whichever one was higher. If the end of the year enrollment was higher, we used that. If the September 30th enrollment was higher, we would use that. That gave for flexibility. Next, what you'll see is the academic considerations. So we wanted to make sure that we were looking at trend data across all of our Title I schools and saying, where's the real need? We've been investing for a few years in math coaches, but we really wanted to define what that role was in comparison to what a resource teacher might do. So we created very clear job descriptions that defined what a resource teacher should do day to day and what a coach will do day to day. Coaching are really for our teachers to perfect their craft, for lack of better word, and resource teachers provide direct instruction for students. And so we wanted to make sure that we were providing some support for our teachers to be able to um, execute the curriculum the way it is designed. The other thing we did was create some variations. If you were a Title I school and a school in improvement, we provided additional staffing to you as well. And you'll see more about that in another slide. Finally, we took into account the fact that the um, Numbers only tell part of the story. There's some data that we can't see centrally that schools have. And so what we did was we allowed for flexibility for schools to request additional positions. So we allocated positions based on the formula but held some back in case schools, well held some funding back rather, 
in case schools had requests, they could substantiate with real school-based data and identify a need. And pretty much every school that requested received additional staffing because they had the data to support the need for that staff. They could not simply ask for um, an extra person. They had to be able to describe what the work of that person would do and how that person's work was directly connected to the data that they provided to us. So again, multiple things taken into consideration to support what the needs were at the school. Can I take one for you? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, next up, you'll see some of the considerations we took into account for our targeted support and improvement schools and our comprehensive support and improvement schools. Um, if you were a targeted support and improvement school, you received additional 0.5 FTE, again, tied to what your data said your school needed, coaching, resource teacher, um, one or the other. If you were a comprehensive support and improvement school, you received a 1.0 additional FTE. Again, that had to support based on what your student data shared you needed. All of our TSI schools that um, were returning to TSI status in the second round of identification by MSDE received an additional um, resource teacher position that provided only instructional support in kindergarten through grade three. And we're funding that in those schools, some through Title I and some through other grants. We just wanted to make sure that those schools had the extra support they needed since the majority of them are elementary. Next uh, are the additional supports in CSI school. We added in some additional leadership supports to help support the school's instructional leadership team with really pushing um, instruction and academic achievement forward. Melissa? Um, all right, I'm gonna talk to you, good evening. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about community schools and what we considered for community schools. Um, so you, it was shared about the difference between the personnel and the per pupil grant. So every school does not receive both grants. Every school receives that personnel grant, but the per pupil comes um, at a different threshold. But some of the things that we considered was similar to what Title I did. We centrally funded some initiatives for schools based off the data we were seeing that it was a need. Some of those positions you see on your screen are a care liaison, um, which was one point, a 1.0 position at all of our schools that received a per pupil allocation. This is because they're in the community school strategy now and they needed support in implementing those programs and initiatives that are occurring. Uh, we also are piloting a transition facilitator at two of our alternative centers, one middle and one high, um, to really bridge that gap with their home schools when they return. So that's a position that we're piloting centrally with community schools. We also partly fund fiscal assistance. We split that cost with Title I. We heard through our schools that this was a need for our schools with all the additional funding that they're receiving, that they need somebody on the school end to assist with that process. Health assistance is something that is um, we use through the blueprint. It talks about additional nursing and health assistant FTEs, so we work with health services to determine which schools need those additional health assistant FTEs. All of our schools receive a community school facilitator that is mandated through Blueprint that we fund that position. And we are also centrally funding some out of school time programming, which is like an expanded learning program programming that can happen before or after school um, for some of our schools based upon their need and their data. We're looking at their needs assessments for community schools and their implementation plans to determine which schools need which programs. So that's kind of our centrally funded initiatives. We also give flexibility to schools and give them their school per pupil allocation and a school funding. And with that, it has to be responsive spending based on school needs. It must be tied to their needs assessment and their implementation plan um, and aligned to evidence-based practices. There's also a consideration for every one FTE for $125,000 in their per pupil allocation. So if they received $125,000, they were able to fund a 1.0 FTE but it had to, again, align to their needs assessment and their implementation plan and within the allowable parameters of the blueprint legislation on what positions could be funded. So it varies per school. So as you um, recall from an earlier slide that Dr. Rogers showed, there's a concentration of poverty in our southwest and our southeast areas and therefore an overlapping in grant funding for, through both Title I and community schools in those same areas. 
so what um, Melissa and I have done is really work to collaborate and make sure schools are looking at all of their available funding and thinking through the lens of what are the needs of the school and then determining which grant will support that need. There are some things that both Title I and community school grant funds can pay for. And we wanna be that bridge to help schools support them with making those decisions. So what you'll see here are um, spending plans that are developed that include both budgets. Well, sometimes three budgets. They're Title mm -hmm. I, they're community school personnel, they're community school per pupil grant. The reason we have one spending plan, again, is to show that coordination. You may have a family engagement event that is partially funded through community schools, partially funded through Title I, because it does meet the need of both. Um, the next thing that we did is we made sure that we both held schools accountable for identifying the data they will use to measure effectiveness over time. Every year, each school, as they decide to um, submit an expense for approval, they must provide the evidence-based practice that that expense was tied to. That's in their spending plan and also in the expense submission. There's an, an annual evaluation that is completed for both grants. There's an external evaluator for community schools and there is an internal evaluator for everything funded through Title I. And then finally, we're really just looking at what support looks like. How can we make sure that schools are aligning spending to where their needs are and then collecting data to measure and monitor the effectiveness of, of their spending. Um, the last thing we wanted to share with you is on both of our websites, and these are links if you click them within the actual presentation, we've provided the grant staffing and in of investment for each of the grants. So for Title I, you will see the, the staffing that the school has, the amount we're paying for staffing, and then the, the school budget that they have on their end. So you'll see all pieces for all schools within our website. And that is all we have. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, any questions? Ms. Humphrey. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a couple questions about the community schools. Sure. Um, on, let me see if I can find this slide, sorry. On slide 10, when you talk about the flexibility and considerations for schools, and specifically um, in terms of the per, per pupil grant, okay. aside from staffing, I know that you mentioned that the funding has to align to the needs assessment. Um, what, what is there a percentage that goes directly to the students aside from staffing, or do you do the staffing first with the grant and then the funding that um, supports students directly aside from staffing um, as the balance of that? So the staffing we give them, we say for every one point uh, for every hundred twenty five thousand dollars, you can receive a one point FTE that has to align to whatever their needs assessment or implementation plan says. Not all schools elect to fund that FTE, and those are outlined in blueprint on which FTEs we're allowed to pay for. Any additional funding has to also align to the wraparound services identified in Blueprint. Um, and MSDE has given us spending guidance on what's allowable and what's not allowable to use with that per people funding. Um, so it's very, it all has to be aligned to their needs assessment, implementation plan, and in addition, Blueprint legislation. Okay, so if the public were looking at um, your example on page, on slide 12, where it says the 40,000 community school funds, th is that separate from staffing or is that? That's the personnel side. You remember I said there's a personnel mm -hmm. and a per people. That's the side of personnel after you take out the facilitator that we have to pay for okay. and the health assistance that we pay for as well. That's the additional funding that they receive. So that 40,000 is still staffing? No, that 40,000, it's called personnel. It's a little okay. wonky. Okay, <laughs> it's okay. just the name through Blueprint. That is also used for the allowable Blueprint wraparound services. It's all within that same bucket. It's just two different funding streams. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, any other questions? Ms. Frimpong. Um, when you mentioned about the evaluations, and I guess that's um, slide 11, so you said for, if I heard correctly, community schools have an external evaluation, but the other schools do not. It's an internal. Um, is that internal to DCPS, or what does that mean, internal yes, versus external? Yes, it's an internal um, evaluator research specialist that we fund in the Office of um, Research Accountability and Assessment, and they evaluate all of our Title I funded initiatives annually and post. Okay, so even though it's internal, they are still separate from the school themselves. Oh, this absolutely, is yes. Okay, so and it is from our office as well. Right, yep, they're very objective. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Savoy. 
under community schools consideration how does a transition facilitator differ from a community school facilitator great question that's actually a new position that we're piloting this year with middle and high schools their purpose is to transition at our alternative centers a lot of our students are sent there for a 90 day period and then they transition back to their home school but while they're at the alternative center they're getting a lot of resources supports mental health services so that transition facilitator will work with the home school to ensure that they still receive those services so hopefully they're not coming back to the alternative center whereas a community school facilitator is outlined in blueprint and we have to follow the guidelines that blueprint gives us for the role of the community school facilitator thank you you're very welcome great presentation thank you okay. any other questions miss demonowski thank you for all this um my question is uh, all of this is based on a formula for the allocation equitable allocation of funds what is that formula can you explain it to me like i don't understand it <laughs> absolutely you want to know the formula we use internally in bcps not how we get the money right okay yes um i have specifics that we can definitely email to you but pretty much what we did was if your poverty percentage was um i think 75 to 100 percent you may have gotten one teacher for every 150 students whereas as your poverty began to drop then you got less ftes per number of students um, the exact numbers i can definitely follow up and send to you the other pieces were related to whether or not you were atsi or csi school um, whether your data how your data looks um, whether you have more of a need in math or more of a need in ela we let stu stu schools submit to us what they'd like to do and then we use the data centrally to confirm that they may fund those types of positions so um, if a school had a paraeducator in a prior year and we were able to look at effectiveness data to see the results of that work we allowed them to excuse me continue to fund that position um, in this upcoming school year and then as far as community schools so community schools for the personnel grant everyone gets a community school facilitator because it's outlined in blueprint and the health assistant fte's additional are determined by health services um, blueprint asks for a nurse we already do a nurse through bcps which is why we do the additional health assistant fte's as needed at the schools for the per pupil side it goes back to that for every hundred twenty five thousand dollars we gave them 1.0 fte and then they could select from allowable um, positions to fund based off blueprint legislation so where does that 125,000 come from that's the average cost of an FTE with full benefits so that we can make sure we are able to fund them yes I would like the specifics emailed to me uh, if you could and then the other thing was the data that you said you used what is it just um, the needs based on um, ELA or math or that kind of data or is it is it more specific a combination so we work very closely with content offices and we let them to tell us what data should we look at we did not look at one data set we looked at multiple data sets sometimes we included attendance and suspension and referral data when making those decisions we looked at unit assessments um, CDAs map in some instances instances MCAP so it was a little bit different depending on what the content area was but if you want me to supply that with you as well I, I can do that yes that would be wonderful thank you and I this last question I think you may have already answered it with um, Dr. Savoy's question but um, what is like the check and balance as far as within us to make sure that our schools are allocating that money equ equitably that they are receiving and making sure that they're you know doing the right thing with it yeah um, both Melissa and I have a group of specialists in senior CSFs who that is their role their role is to go into those schools every single day monitor the use of those programs talk with schools about spending their funding strictly on things that are aligned to their data and not on things that aren't included in their school progress plan um, we then do annual reviews of their documentation and we sit with them twice a year to go over spending and really talk about whether or not it's yielding results so there's a lot of hand holding yes <laughs> and, and support around making sure that things happen the way we need to thank you very much you're welcome thank you any other questions okay thank you so much what a great thank presentation you. great way to discuss equitable resource allocation
The next item on the agenda is the report on the 2024-2025 professional development plan. And for that, I call on Dr. Rogers. Great. All right, I'm being joined by Dr. Grimm, Chief Operating Officer, and Dr. Berkowitz, Executive Director for Employee Training and Development. If we can pull up the PowerPoint, please. Got the image oh. on the screen? Good evening, again, Board Chair <laughs> Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Um, as Dr. Rogers said, we are here this evening um, to talk about professional learning. Oh, I don't know why we did that. <laughs> and now it's me. Um, this presentation really is gonna focus on two of our key priorities as a school system, academic achievement, which is the overall goal, making sure that our students are able to achieve at high levels in a variety of ways, all students. Um, but in order to do that, we know that we need highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff. And so uh, the team will uh, present to you the plan for this upcoming school year. Uh, but before we do that, we just want to call to your attention a slide that we've shared before in the past. And that's about systemic and sustainable improvement. For all school systems that really want to improve student achievement across the board, make that improvement, and then sustain the improvement over time, there are three key elements, as I've shared before. It starts with curriculum, and so we are grateful for the board support. Um, to ensure that we have high quality curriculum aligned to standards and we're excited about the pilot for secondary literacy this upcoming year and really ensuring that everything we do is evidence-based and that we are out leaders in schools as well as central office leaders out and about in schools on a regular basis uh, monitoring implementation to ensure that there's fidelity uh, the key piece of that work is professional learning, making sure that everyone is equipped to do their best work. Um, this includes teachers, paraprofessionals, leaders inside of buildings, as well as leaders in central office who are supervising the work. And um, the way that we operationalize this is through professional learning community. And so we have started that work um, uh, late this spring, continued it in the summer, and have a robust plan uh, throughout the year to ensure that I, not only our schools, um, including our teachers and members of the leadership team, but also our offices are engaging in um, collaborative cycles of inquiry where we're looking at the data that is in front of us, identifying what the data is telling us, what are those patterns, and teachers are going back in real time uh, to make changes for the students that are in the classrooms in front of them. Uh, one of the articles that we spent a lot of time focusing on um, last year and we will continue this school year is uh, Spark and Sustain by the McKinsey and Company. And uh, their uh, key quote is ground systems strategy and better classroom instruction. And that's really what we've been focused on, uh, focusing on as a school system, ensuring that we have uh, everyone is trained for high quality classroom instruction. And so we wanted to start um, this presentation really getting into, um, into the content of it by sharing with you a slide that you saw last month um, in a presentation that Dr. Jones and Dr. DiDonato shared with you regarding professional learning and as it specifically related to our schools. And as you can see by this slide, professional development is at the heart. It's at the center between high quality instructional materials evidence-based instructional practices, instructional support visits, and data analysis. It's been a very, very busy summer for us here at Team BCPS with regard to professional learning. BCPS took unprecedented steps in preparation and to kick off the 2024-2025 school year as related to professional learning. Professional learning is integral in the priority area of highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff. In fact, it is because of highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff that academic achievement excels, infrastructure is upgraded, and the safety and climate of all BCPS facilities is conducive to continuous improvement. Professional learning for 2024 actually kicked off and started back in early spring, as Dr. Rogers said, when the groundwork for professional learning communities, or PLCs, and research for better teaching, or RBT as you'll see it, was introduced and in some areas reintroduced to staff. In June, immediately after school ended for students, 
staff began engaging in professional learning, starting with our elementary school principals and assistant principals. From there, each of the groups identified on this slide participated in professional learning. Additionally, we have accelerated training for administrators and teacher leaders in CSI and TSI schools. So I'll speak a little bit about the busy summer that we had, just highlights. We had 13 full days of professional learning for staff in leadership positions. We also had two days that um, any teacher or paraeducator had the opportunity to attend. And we were very excited that we had 5,497 teachers um, agree to, to come back after school ended. And our goal was really to outline the foundational expectations for teaching and learning in BCPS. It was very much a back to the basics focus. And we ended up um, grouping our schools in groups of two, three, or four across 65 different sites. And we trained 189 central office staff members. Um, our, our chiefs were trained, our specialists were trained, everyone in central office said yes, we're going to participate in this. And they delivered content to those teachers in schools on June 24th. Each site started the day with a virtual keynote that Dr. Rogers recorded so that everyone heard the exact same message on what are the foundational beliefs about teaching and learning in BCPS. And then they rotated through five different sessions that were designed centrally. And then the folks that were facilitating were also trained centrally. And the topics were high expectations, momentum and attention, routines, clarity, and objective. So we were very specific about the back to the basics components that we wanted everyone to, to hear. Um, I was very nervous about getting those written, and I looked at Dr. Rogers, and I said, who's, who's going to write all of these? And Dr. Rogers said, we're, we're going to do it. So our superintendent and our cabinet actually helped to write content, which I think is pretty amazing. A lot of times professional development is coming from other places. So it, it came right here from, from our group. Um, and it was based on the core components of John Safier's Skillful Teacher. So everyone had the opportunity to kind of dip their toe into the, the skillful teacher work, where we have other groups that are um, digging a lot deeper into that, which you'll, you'll hear about that as we move forward. Um, we did give the staff the opportunity to give us some feedback. And I, I know you've heard a lot of presentations on professional learning. It's hard to get decent scores. People don't love professional learning. But we are very happy that um, all, of our, all of our modules had um, over a four, except for one, and that was a 3.94. So we got, we got very good scores. And then we also asked folks to rate their overall experience with the June 24th teaching and learning expectations. And we had 42% of respondents were extremely satisfied. Um, the next level down was a, a, a four. We had five, four, three, two, one. 24%, 22%, and then 9% and 3%. So we were very pleased with, with the results. Um, and then I won't speak to all of the different types of sessions that we had in the 13 days, because we just don't have the time. But Dr. Rogers mentioned multiple times professional learning communities. So I will share that that's one area where we wanted to have a common message across all of our different groups, elementary principals, elementary assistant principals, secondary principals and assistant principals, staff development teachers, department chairs, our central office leaders all had a session on professional learning communities that was modified to their role. Um, and in that, we were able to clarify the expectations, what do we want to see as a district around structures for professional learning communities, um, what do we expect to see when we observe those communities in action. Um, and after the session, participants were again asked to rate their satisfaction, their ability to apply it to their work. And the overall rating across all of those sessions was a 4.2 out of 5. We were very happy with that as well. So looking ahead, I know at a previous board meeting, um, you, you learned that the Department of Organizational Development and Leadership was merged with the Department of Employee Training and Development. And the purpose of that was to really support focused leadership facilitation, coordination, evaluation of everything related to high quality professional development for all of our staff. We work with all five of our unions and our unrepresented team members. Um, we've already had the chance to 
hit the ground running. We spent a lot of time collaborating with operations team members, curriculum and instruction team members, and the Division of Schools team members to outline our plan for the year. We have all of our dates on the calendar. We start with our principals and assistant principals, and then we go to groups. So there are right now hundreds of professional learnings already calendared, scheduled at the Employee Development Center um, and on people's calendars so they can start moving forward with the rest of their planning for this school year. We also uh, gathered feedback from pilots that um, were conducted in the 2023-24 school year. We had a focused effort to um, to have more professional learning beyond our teachers and administrators. And we had great success with pilots, so we will continue our new programs for central office professionals for their leadership development, for our office professionals, for our paraprofessionals, and also for our operations staff members, specifically our team members and team leads. Our pilots will become full programs next year. So we hope to continue to expand our offerings for our AFSME team members and our ESPDC and OPE team members. As noted previously, professional learning is at the heart of school improvement. High quality instructional materials, evidence-based instructional materials, instructional visits, and data analysis, coupled with professional development, will result in system improvement. Through professional learning across schools and offices, we hope to reduce variability and emphasize highly effective teachers, leaders, and staff. We will measure the effectiveness of professional learning with qualitative and quantitative data through program reviews, climate surveys, and registration, registration system feedback like Liz just shared, shared. And that was out of five, by the way, all those four um, <laughs> scores that she was mentioning. But with the ultimate goal of observing changes in beliefs, knowledge, and practice. And that's why you see that highlighted um, and bolded in the center of this slide. Our expectation is that across our schools and offices, so it's really important to note that, that this plan is not just about our schools, but it's about all those staff that support our schools in many various ways. We know that those bus drivers are that first face that our kids see each and every day. We know that in the cafeterias, our building service workers, our grounds workers, our staff in fiscal services and human resources need that professional learning just as our teachers and our school-based staff, our paras, our administrators, in order to, to effectively provide those wraparound services to meet the needs of our kids. So we are excited about this plan and we look to forward to your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. This is very exciting, and I and I want to thank Ms. Burquist. Did I say that right? Burquist. Dr. Burquist. Um, on it was such a phenomenal new teacher orientation. The energy in that building was just phenomenal. I mean, Ms. Sexton was giving out fifty dollar bills. <laughs> There was the stories being told. I had an opportunity to meet with a lot of educators that are either new to Baltimore County or that are new to Baltimore County, but they they may not be new to teaching. They've come from other school systems, and um, it was just a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And all board members received invitations to all of the professional learnings that were happening this summer. Our calendars were packed. I'm like, what are all these dates? It was fun it's just phenomenal what you all are doing. So I just wanted to say um, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for being there as well. Any questions from board members? Uh, Ms. Yes, uh, Ms. Dominowski. Yes, uh, thank you for all that. I, I just had one observation for the measures of effectiveness. Um, maybe it's just implied, but wouldn't student outcomes be a measure of effectiveness for this as well? As I mean, the more professional development, we would hope that our students would be, you know, benefiting from that as well. Ab absolutely, and I and I think when we go when we go back to that, um, those observations that we see, those ch those changes in beliefs, those changes in structures that we observe in the classroom are going to lead to that student achievement. Yep. And the other question I had was about the um, surveys that you did at the end, with the grading one to five. Mm -hmm. Were there any uh, opportunities for written comments? Oh yes. Yes. We Were always. <laughs> Will we be able to see those? Oh, sure. Okay. I would There's I'd love to see those. a whole host of qualitative okay. comments. <laughs> Thank you. And so the 
the written comments, that's a, what, there's 5,000 edgy? Yeah. there are many. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm just wondering, are you going to read through all 5,000 written comments? Or is it that you just want like a sampling of what they I'll said? I'll take either. I mean, I'll, I'll go through all of them. I, I don't know. I can skim read. I can go through. I just, I would like to, I wasn't able to attend, so I'd like to hear from um, our educators how it went. We can provide a summary. Yeah. So uh, you're not going to give me all of them? The 5,000? No. But we can we can provide um, some a sampling of of uh, but educator but then comments. Then how 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 would you how are you going to break it down of which ones you're going to give me and not give me? Give you some of each one of them so that we already have a percentage breakdown. Like you know I forget what the number was. So if there's fifty five percent said extremely highly satisfied, you get fifty five percent of the sample of what some of those people said. So we'll break it down representative according to the data. Okay. All right. Ms. Stileski? Yeah, just a quick, um, could, could it be sent to the full board? Thank you. Absolutely. I wasn't on a uh, microphone. Any other questions? No one. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on safety and climate, and for that, I call on Dr. Jones. Good evening. Good evening. At this time, we're joined by Dr. Jones, Chief of Schools, Sergeant Knox. I guess we're not supposed to say Sergeant uh -huh. anymore. <laughs> Mr. Knox, Executive Director of School Safety, and Ms. Mustafer, Director of Student Support Services. This time, they will provide a report on safety and climate, uh, the year in review, uh, school year 24-25, to include technical uh, changes, adaptive changes, um, and an overall update on our progress uh, related to safety and climate across our schools in Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Next slide, please. We are very excited to bring to you um, a safety and climate report that reflects our work from last um, school year. As you know, safety, the Department of Safety and the Department of Student Services rests within the Division of Schools, and it allows us to really work collaboratively um, across the Department of Schools and with um, the two departments to bring about um, change as it relates to the superintendent's priorities. So on the screen, you just see the description that talks about the expectations, the consistent responses, and just the work that happens to ensure we have safe learning environments. So I'm very excited and very pleased to work with this team of professionals that allow students to be at the center of their work every day. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Eric Knox. Student conduct hearing officers were transitioned to the Department of School Safety to have consistency and alignment with the work that we do in this office. Student safety assistants were uh, implemented across all schools, on 13 elementary schools and across the uh, entire district. They were moved from a grant funded position well over to the operating budget for fiscal year 2024 to 2025. School safety managers and I remain on call 24-7, and this is around the clock each and every day, even at board meetings. While you all are sleeping, we're still out working, making sure all students, staff, and stakeholders can arrive at school and feel safe. Um, school, sa school resource officer program serves all schools. We have elementary floaters, middle schools are all covered, and high schools as well. And if you look to the right of the slide, we, ha we will showcase the very impactful leadership of Dr. Rogers and Chief Robert McCullough, how we identify our SROs of the year. At the top, Officer Gilbert, he's a Precinct 3 floater for elementary schools. Officer Pitts, Precinct 7, Cockeysville Middle School, and Officer Long, Precinct 9, Rosedale Alternative were the SROs of the year. Uh, Baltimore County Police were grant funded for positions at athletic events and site events and they were well 
received by stakeholders, staff, and community members. Uh, I myself would work some of those events before I transitioned, and it was welcoming to have students walk up to you and staff members and parents that were very thankful that we were in the community and supporting them. Security vendors will also continue to be funded, and they were attending our events as well, and we saw um, the adequate coverage grant for law enforcement personnel was maintained and still committed through our BCPS. Next slide, please. For safety and security technology enhancements, Omni Alert weapons detection system still remains and is placed at all schools across 7,000 cameras that we have in our building. And I had one alert that came in tonight, so it is uh, very active and we're very aware of what's going on. Um, we still remind parents, students, and staff, and stakeholders that look-alike weapons, including real weapons, are not allowed on our school properties. And we remain diligent, diligent in making sure that is kept up. Digital mapping, we're working with our police partners, aviation units, and uh, computer-aided dispatch to make sure we have digital images of our buildings using CAD to make sure responses to buildings are electronic and that our law enforcement partners and fire department partners are aware to see what's going on and where they need to go to deal with emergencies. Open gate systems, athletic, the Office, office of Athletics uh, secured funding along with the Department of School Safety for open gate metal detectors. They are mobile metal detectors that will be set up at athletic events along with restrictions that they put in place. And we've begun to, to get shipments of those and they will be in place for the first athletic events of the school year. And we have training into this week for training the trainer to make sure all athletic directors are aware of what's going on with that. Visitor screening still remains with Raptor and it alerts us for um, the unfortunate event that a sex offender would come into our buildings and we're alerted with that as well. And camera and surveillance upgrades remain through facilities and IT. Um, as Dr. Rogers spoke about all central office staff visiting buildings as I visit, I am seeing a representative numbers of numbered classrooms in the windows as I approach buildings and that aids our law enforcement and fire department partners with knowing where school classrooms are by number. We have funding going into this school year that will ad have additional secured vestibules installed, knocks boxes for fire department partners to gain keys for the school buildings by access and not have to wait for building monitors to respond. And we uh, disseminated reunification supplies for schools as well. Next slide, please. We secured over $2.5 million in grant funds to aid in uh, security-related efforts. We updated chapters 1, 2, 3, 5, and 6 of the Comprehensive Safety Plan and worked to revise the MOU with the Baltimore County Police Department. We updated the guide to safe schools and SRO administrators and provided an active assailant drills and emergency drills across all schools as well. We also participated in a statewide emergency drill that was very active and very well received. We held the 27th Annual Safe Schools Conference and sponsored the attendance of NASRO, National Association of School Resource Officers in Phoenix, Arizona for our school SROs. Next slide, please. The slide shows a glimpse or a look at office referrals and alternative consequences, and we see a decline, about 11,000 across both. While we do see an increase in suspensions, that just means at, at a glimpse that while we're decreasing the amount of office referrals and alternative consequences, we are in alignment with the student code of conduct and are implementing school suspensions as needed. The data review indicates a 93% adherence to the code of conduct, and we are still in alignment with this, with the uh, laws, including preschool age manifestation, disability of low and level offenses, and we receive alternative consequences when needed. And next slide, please. Can I roll it down, Ms. Mill? Thank you, Mr. Knott. Um, student support services in alignment with the prioritizing of preserving the safe learning spaces. 
um, we are really committed to strengthening the school communities through compassionate, but also having students equitably access supports and resources um, as children really expand and they explore their pathways for college career, but also life readiness as well. Um, what you will see on this slide is um, the tiered system of support, which is centered. Um, and that really represents a promote, an effort to promote, prevent, but also provide interventions that meet the vast needs of our students. Um, and while we, we will say to you, student support services is comprised of all of those folks on the left, what we know is that at central office, we lay the foundation. We provide professional learning, provide coaching, um, and we provide that just-in-time problem solving with all of our partners, including safety, um, with the schools. What we also know, though, is that for, it, for this effort to be operationalized and to truly support students and understand the needs of our students, um, all of that takes place at a multidisciplinary level at the schoolhouse. These are folks every day that are working in partnership across our schools to provide supports and resources for our students. Next slide, please. So this slide represents, um, many of you may remember Naviance, um, which was our previous web-based platform for um, our students to com explore their college career as well as their social emotional readiness. We have to have life readiness goals too. Um, and what we did over the past year under the leadership of Dr. Rogers as well as Dr. Jones is we took a high level look at our school counseling services and really explored. We talked to multiple stakeholder groups and really it wanted to hear from them as to what what they needed to be successful, what they needed to explore their college career and, and their life ready skills. And so in that, what we found from our stakeholders, we need to be consistent. We need to have platforms that are ready for the students of today. And so Zello has afforded, affords us that opportunity. Um, it contains course planning options. It contains a wealth of scholarship opportunities for our students to explore and look at. It contains surveys that students can take to consider what's my career pathway or do I wanna go to college or do I wanna go along this career path or what are the areas when we talked um, earlier about students making decisions. How am I gonna make those decisions and what influences my decision making but also what are my resources available to support me. And so in our work with our school counseling team, you heard Dr. Berkowitz speak about the professional learning that's going on. Our school counselors also have been part of that professional learning to really align expectations for the purpose of consistency. And Zello is one of those platforms that we're using to do that, to provide access to all of our students, not just about college, but career and life skills as well. Next slide. So the next few slides that I'm gonna speak about are slides that really are grounded in our belief and our commitment to our students and our families as we prioritize the social, emotional, and the mental health needs of our students. Um, what you see in front of, here, in front of you here is um, a depiction of um, the Maryland Consortium of Coordinated Community Supports. That's a mouthful. It's an outgrowth of Blueprint. and. Um, this is another way that we've expanded our mental health services. Keep in mind that Baltimore County has 19 community mental health partners that already exist in our system. Through the, part, through the consortium work, we have added eight spokes, which are service providers, who will provide an array of services really focused on our uninsured and underinsured student, students. Um, these students will, these services will be provided at 111 schools across our system. The two pie charts that you see there really reflect where these services are gonna be showing up. So when you look at the zones, you're seeing this pretty equitable distribution across the east, the central, and the west zone. When you look at the schools, the providers that are providing to schools, our spokes per se, um, within this, the hub spoke model of the consortium, we see that we have more services that are leveraged at the elementary school level. And we know that that needs to be a focus in our future to make sure that when we're looking at all levels of service, 
that we're, we are seeing more services at the secondary level as well. So that's opportunity that's coming forward in conversation with our spokes in the years ahead, in the next year. Next slide, please. Another expansion of uh, mental health services is our Talkspace, um, our Talkspace platform. So Talkspace, if you all recall, and thank you to many of you, we were able to advance the Talkspace contract mid last year and then implement Talkspace across Baltimore County high schools for children 13 and older. Talkspace has a couple components to it that are important. The first being that it offers self-guided lessons. What does that mean? That means if you are struggling with something, let's say anxiety, and you wanna know more about that, you can dive into one of these self-guided um, lessons and really explore, learn about yourself, but also learn about what are the resources that can aid me in managing how I'm feeling right now. Not just the resources at home, but also in the school communities as well. And then the next um, option that's available to our students is Talkspace Therapy, which is, um, I'm sorry, the unlimited messaging um, therapy that is provided by a licensed clinician um, to students. So that is something that we're really proud of in moving forward. And I think the next slide will give you why uh, we are pretty proud of this, this initiative. So what the data says here on the left, what you will see is, is we have students who are participating. The exciting part about this um, and what we have learned from pre and post surveys is that 44% of those who took advantage of Talkspace are brand new to therapy. We created a pathway for our students to be engaged in taking care of themselves. So this is something students may never have explored. As COVID taught us, we have learned to explore not only what's face-to-face, -face, but what are the remote options that are available? And this is one of, of those many pathways. The other thing that I think is, is, is important is 69% clinical satisfaction with a 4.1 out of five rating of those therapists who are engaging our students. Um, and, and lastly, on the um, chart to the right, um, 63% of those who engaged noted in a post survey, they're still doing well. They're still finding success and utilizing the skills that they used previously. Next page. So another um, initiative that we kicked off last year was the Here For It campaign. And you may have seen talks at schools, the posters, you may have heard all of the championing about um, attending. There's lots of um, interesting things I've noticed on Twitter of folks celebrating attendance, including what I heard today was an attend dance. So there's a dance affiliated with those who are attending. Um, so we, we found success with this and saw that we were closing the gap with, the, with attendance and improving our, really reaching out to our students who are chronically um, absent from school. So we're, we are in that improvement phase in this initiative. And then what we are going to continue to do for 2020, 2024, 25 school year is we're going to continue the campaign. We're going to revisit expectations. We're going to revisit that every single school must have an attendance campaign, which we did have last year, or attendance team, which we did have last year. We're also gonna leverage um, all of the interventions and supports that we've kind of talked about tonight, but in addition, what's happening at the school to customize those responses to our students and their needs. So as we talk about a tiered system of support, another intervention that we, two other interventions we're looking forward to is one, student success mentors. We're looking at students specifically in our Southeast area who've had years, it could have been multiple years of chronic attendance needs. So we are gonna be identifying student success mentors with our schools to be able to connect them. What we know is that one of the reasons students don't come to school is because they don't feel connected and they don't feel like they belong. That's national data. This is one component um, under Dr. Rogers, who had the insight to move it forward and share with us to think, to consider this option. This is one way to provide that level of connection, but also to help our students find their sense of belonging through that one connected adult, or maybe it's one connected peer. 
um, that would serve as the, student, as the student success mentor. So um, that's an initiative that we are moving forward. The second part of that is attendance calendars. This is a tool to offer to the mentors, but also to families and students to be reflective in their attendance and, mo and self-monitoring their attendance and how they're doing with that. And what do they need to correct if, if attendance isn't going well? Next slide, please. And the last and final um, slide here is we all know that there are very strong emotions uh, when we have traumatic events and losses in our communities. Um, some of the um, losses may come at the expense of a loss of a peer, could be the loss of a staff member, could be a key bridge collapse. And so as we think about those strong emotions and how they impact our schools and our schools communities, one of the responses that we have is that we have traumatic loss teams. Those teams are, there are 11 of those teams and they're comprised of school-based staff that are specifically trained in traumatic loss that are organized to be responsive and go out to schools when there are events that prompt a higher level and a higher level of support that's needed. And so their focus in going out is really creating space for expression, leveraging that space for healing and moving forward in planning and understanding what's ahead of them. So that team works in collaboration. Um, we had 41 requests last school year. Um, and some of that, those responses were central office. I, with members of my central office team, we would go out. We might go out in partnership with our safety partners to really support the school. Or we could just deploy a team to go out to the school with all of the, all of the supportive resources um, to manage the community, to support the schools in managing their needs. And with that, the last, very last slide, we wanna say thank you for this opportunity for helping, uh, for, for supporting us and sharing this critical information. And we welcome questions. Yes, any questions? Ms. Pumphrey. I have a question about the um, open gate weapons detection system. Yeah. On the slide, it, you mentioned um, purchase for athletic events and select schools. So when you say select schools, that, is that aside from athletic events? And is that something that's used on a daily basis? It could be. It just depends on what the need is and where they will be. They're mobile, so they could be moved anywhere. Athletic events inside of a school, so if we determine a need, we'll move it and use it accordingly. Okay, and is this something just that just the students or attendees walk through? You walk through. Picture it. Okay. Uh, pillars that you walk through and it will alert in the uh, detection of, of odd metals okay. within your uh, packages or cases. Thank you. And my other question is about the um, additional secure vestibules. I, in my visits, I've noticed that some schools still don't have those secure vesti vestibules. Um, are we trying to, at this point, you know, obviously um, when, you know, funding is available, are we trying to um, ensure that all of our schools have these secure vestibules? Are we working towards that or is it something that um, some schools were just not going to be able to achieve. Since Mr. Knox just started a few weeks ago, not even two, I'm going <laughs> to jump in there and try to help him out. Um, we're working very closely with the county executive where we receive grant funding, pass through grant funding to add those vestibule projects. So um, it's a combination of grant funding as well as capital projects that come up. There are a few of the school structures, um, much like the conversation we were having about water earlier, because we have the third set of oldest buildings across the state of Maryland. Some of the school structures, um, until we have a, uh, a pretty comprehensive renovation to what may be the front or the side of the front, it's gonna require a lot, but we do have a rollout plan to uh, implement, yeah, add that additional layer of security as much as possible uh, with the pass-through grant that we have, which, um, several billion dollars and, and several projects this summer and will continue. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Hinch. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for this presentation. Um, this must have been the talk space initiative has got to be the most exciting um, initiative that I care very personally about. And the statistic you shared that 44% of those that have engaged, students that have engaged with talk space had never um, been to therapy just really tugged at, tugs at the heartstrings. That's powerful. Um, if we can reach one student, that in and of itself justifies this initiative. But can you share um, 
what is our engagement in terms of numbers of students that have used any of the Talkspace services and how we plan to expand and get the word out that this amazing service is available, how we you know, work with our schools to get the word out. Absolutely. So one of the things that we did last year and what we have on the horizon this year, so if you're coming to BC, Yes, Fest, plug right there. Um, <laughs> they will be there, and they have been joining all of our mental health initiatives as well as just our community provider and partnership meetings. We do know that we want this to expand far and wide because we do see this, the utility in it, and we do get the feedback from students, um, you know, with 69% being satisfied with what they have and 4.1 aligned to somebody, a caring and trusted adult. Uh, identified as a therapist, but of course, um, that connection, we definitely know that we need to expand. The, the activities that we are doing, we have several school, high school visits set up. Our goal is to cover all high schools to make sure this information gets out. We are also working with our communications office to ensure that information gets out ahead of the school year. So as students are returning, getting information into principal newsletters, but also having there to be a presence. Um, you will also, if you go to any athletic events, we are looking at talk spaces approaching us about being present at those events as well. Part of this, um, the advancement of talk space really comes down to prioritizing it with our student support staff and making sure members of BCPS across the board know that that's a resource. You may have seen even in community messaging, uh, when there is traumatic events, we include talk space as a resource for our high school students. So continuing to advance that, continuing to message, making it highly visible um, is the approach that we are using to get the information out to students um, on an ongoing basis. And my hope is we could come back and say that we have even more students using the platform as well. But um, I appreciate your point that even one is, is. Do we know how many have engaged thus L far? Let me go ahead and share some numbers here. Thank you. Um, we have uh, 2,834 messaging sessions that occurred and 17,006 chat messages between providers and students uh, that occurred uh, since our rollout in the spring. And do we know how many unique students that, does that entail? No, some of that it, information is confidential. We do know how many students provided direct feedback about the effectiveness. That was 357 uh, students who provided specific feedback where some students opted not to share feedback. Sure, but we have the c they have the capacity. We, our contract allows us to uh, make the service available to, to all who choose to use it 13 and older. Yes. So um, it's a matter of getting the word out and Yes, letting you're others know it's right. available. Yes. So that that's fantastic. Yes, they do have the capacity as they agreed to, when they agreed to the contract. They did know what our um, high school capacity was, so they do have that. Um, so and we've been assured of that. Um, so as we continue to expand and offer the service, there will be the availability of this. And we know that this it, that it's a need. So we we just need to align that need with. Um, this resource. So thank you for sharing. Again, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Damanowski and then Ms. Frimpong. Th thank you. Um, just on that talk space too, uh, how is the clinical improvement measured? Do you, are you? So the, the clinical improvement is a pre and post survey that's offered. Uh, I believe it's a six question survey that really digs into what's the satisfaction of the, of the end user being the student. And so they respond to those survey questions. That's not something that's that's not something that that we house in BCPS. It's information that is shared with us um, as a result of those surveys being provided to the end user via TalkSpace platform. Okay, thank you. Um, the other question about that was, um, well, I, I agree that that's a great resource. Is there anything on the TalkSpace that helps kids to, you know, communicate with each other instead of going to a device or a, a you know, to help, I think a lot, I, I'm noticing a lot that we're, we're relying a lot on our phones and a lot of electronics when, um, and not as much as when we were growing up, we went out and played with our friends and we talked to our friends. Right. So is there something on there that helps kids, you know, make, not make friends, but like, you know, relate to their peers better or be outgoing and that kind of thing, R rely on them as a source of, you know. Yeah. 
I think what you would see is if you went through the, um, the lessons, there's a lot of cultivating how you extend yourself as an individual to others, including your peers, really offering the opportunity of what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. And then when you've um, engaged in a mistake, how do you course correct that? Um, is there a facilitation of like a chat room in there for per se peer interaction? No. Good. No, but, no, I didn't mean that. But there, <laughs> but there are encouraging lessons that do offer the opportunity in how we engage socially with our peers. That's great. That's all. I mean, more like that, not like chatting. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, my other thing was about the new Omni Alert. Um, when will we have um, you know some data to look at as far? I know it's brand new, but to say like how it's improving our school safety, and and what will be the measurements that we use for that. To look to Dr. Rogers for that. Um, I can tell you probably all that I've received, every alert that's ever come out, but um, data wise, we would have to employ how that's going to be rolled out to you. Yes. Um, you know, the purpose of Omni Alert and leveraging technology is to provide that extra set of safety without um, uh, changing the school uh, climate in such a way where, where students and staff members are feeling. Uh, you know, the safety threats that's out there. So when OmniAlert uh, and other companies' weapons detection, uh, they come and they speak to schools and they speak to offices, they talk about prevention, that their, their number one goal is in terms of preventing any um, serious, uh, you know, events from happening. They compare schools uh, and states that have them installed compared to places where that doesn't exist. And um, unfortunately, sometimes, you know, uh, children or adults make different choices. Um, I, I think for us, uh, it, it's really about prevention. Also, having partnered with the chief of police as well as the county executive to send out to all, um, I think, over 800,000 residents in Baltimore County uh, that there is Omni Alert in schools, what the expectations are, even if people are playing or going to a community event, is is really what everybody's looking for. I know it's, it's really what our law enforcement partners are looking for, is that we're keeping, um, that it's more preventative in nature as opposed to, I, it, of course, if there's an emergency, it, it's gonna respond. We know that from, you know, children bring water guns on uh, property, so we know that it's operational, but that I think the overall goal is for it to serve as a deterrent um, and, and keep our schools safer in that way. Yeah, I, I understand, uh, and then that's great, I, I, but I just wanted to know if um, we would see any kind of report or data just to reinforce that, how it's, how it's encouraging that within our students that it's you know it's it's bringing that level of safety into our schools that it was meant to do Does that make like what basically w how are we measuring its effectiveness how are we, the cost ratio like, you know you always say if this curriculum or whatever we're trying to buy or whatever like there needs to be a you know cost analysis with it like as far as how are we measuring its effectiveness so I, I think we're measuring its effectiveness in, in terms of, um, well, I, I, w I wouldn't want the opposite to happen. Right. No. Um, <laughs> and so I'm, 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 I'm a little, you know, stuck on, on what we're uh, trying to achieve. The whole appeal to schools and agencies is adults and children making different choices, alternative choices. So I, I think we could certainly provide a report in how many um, false, issues, uh, you know, the system picked up so you know that it's actually providing those alerts. But I don't know that um, there is a way to quantify um, people that perhaps would have made a different choice if cameras weren't watching. But we, we can certainly uh, provide, you know, an update on how many, um, you know, water guns and things like it's picked up in JROTC students practicing and things like that. We certainly have that that right. we could share. That would be yeah. great. Thank okay. you. Okay, that's not a problem. And um, also uh, with consequences and having being consistent in our consistency, consistent with our consequences, when we have like say a, a level three offense, I'm noticing that, you know, we have half, you know, there's a suspension and alternative consequences. So there's still kind of that not consistent. So how do we, wh why would one person who committed a level three offense get a suspension and someone get, and another one would get a, like a wraparound service or an alternative consequence? 
I'll answer that. We've, we've been working um, very closely with our Office of Law, the Student Conduct Hearing Officers, um, our partners in the Department of Special Education to really unpack um, any areas of inconsistency. And we do feel like last year was a great opportunity for us to bring about um, greater consistency. And we are now applying policy, BCPS policy, superintendent's rule, and of course, Comar to really be our guide for what happens as it relates to the application of, of the student handbook. So we would hope that, um, and we did see last year in comparison to previous years where there was greater consistency. Whenever there are those egregious offenses, we, we have team meetings and we discuss and make sure that there is um, a high level of consistency. We came to uh, work very closely with Sergeant Knox because we work with our partners to make sure that any egregious um, offenses, those category, um, those category three offenses, that the handbook was applied with a high level of consistency. Now we know that they are, none of our students are the same. Um, things that happen in our schools aren't exactly the same. So we, then we have to think about um, any type of special services again. But we use the law to really make and um, determine the decisions that we um, that we make. And we meet weekly um, proactively to really just think about how are we um, measuring our work against policy rule and of course the law. Thank you. Ms. Mm -hmm. Dominowski, just wanna um, share, for category three offenses, 20% of students received alternative consequences. Most of those were dictated by law, like preschool age law uh, precludes us from certain um, consequences. Students where the IEP team comes together, students receiving special services, and they determine as a team yes. that it's the manifestation of the disability. Um, that also precludes us from moving forward with uh, a board suspension. And so there, there was a much smaller percentage. I just wanted to provide some of those specific numbers for this last school year that just passed, which was very different than before. No, that that's great information to know. Thank you. Ms. Frimpong. a lot of good information in this presentation. Um, so Mr. Knox, for the mobile detectors, we talked about, um, well, that they're mobile. So for example, when there's a sporting event, and let's say it's regional, so it's not held on the school site, it may be held somewhere else, it may be one of the community colleges, but we still have the ability to use the mobile metal detectors there as well for those type of events? Uh, possibly, it would depend on the rules of that site, so we would have to navigate their specific rules, but if it's mobile and at our event, uh, we should be able to use it, but we would have to check with the hosting agency that has uh, jurisdiction over that site. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then, um, Ms. Mustafa, mm -hmm. um, for slide 11, where we saw the safety and climate, we saw different information about the mental health services. So there are five bars here on this chart, and um, the the category of presenteeism, um, those other categories I've, I've heard before, but what is presenteeism? What does that mean? So presenteeism is looking at being available and present. So it, it's kind of when they ask you a question um, in a survey that says, were you present during this? Were you available? Were you attuned and astute um, to what was happening around you? And that's what would they would calculate when they're talking about that. Okay. That could be the type of question, I think. So how is that different than engagement? Is, is being present just a body being there versus engagement is that actual interaction? Engagement would be your interaction. Your presenteeism is you actually being present and available for what's happening. Engagement is actually the action of being engaged in the activity and engaging in like this instruction. And presenteeism is being present in that moment and available. Um, so there, those, it's ve very close, very close in proximity with it, with respect to what it looks like, but it's different in how it's analyzed. Gotcha. Okay. And then for the the stress category, mm -hmm. so. Um, if we're talking about extreme levels of distress to where a student is even considering you know, taking their life, is there some additional type of support? Are there referrals to actual therapists maybe that are local that you can do something um, face to face with? Absolutely. And 
Yeah, I'm old school, so I know that, you know, a lot of people do things online or whatever, but I think there's something to be said for that. Yes, absolutely. So if a student uh, within the Talkspace platform um, identifies and says, I'm in extreme distress, um, those are trained clinicians. So they will immediately kick into assessing for level of threat and making sure that there are resources mobilized to secure um, and, and address the needs of the student. If that's calling... Um, 911, um, if that's simply a referral to a face-to-face -face clinician, speaking with the parent, all of those things are things that, that are resources that are available in that platform that would, they, would, they would engage in. Mm -hmm. Additionally, in, the, in schools, we would do very much the same thing. You, you speak to old school, so a little bit you're speaking my language. But, <laughs> um, but absolutely, we would, if a student ex is experiencing distress, and depending on the level of distress, we would work with that student to really identify what their needs are and then determine that level of intervention. We talked about the tiered supports. What will be the best support resource in this situation? Of course, working directly with the parent to make sure that that student's safety is secured, and, th and that's number one in situations where you hear of distress. Right. And then last question. I think it was slide nine, but there was a, um, I don't know if I put it in the wrong, um, there was a pie chart and it talked about the different levels, elementary, middle, and high. We saw more at the elementary level. Yes. And you know, one thing that you also see is kind of a trend as, as the students get older, parental involvement is not as much. Mm -hmm. So is some of that um, at the elementary school level, does it come from parents, does it come from staff, or is it the, teach the students directly that are making use of the services as far as a referral to the parent goes? So the services that are identified in that pie chart looking at the various levels, those are services that have been identified by the spokes that they will be providing. So this is just what, the ser what level will, will the services be provided at. So we haven't really, this is really a, uh, something that's in formation and just actually started in the spring under the consortium. So we don't really have the impact as far as the outcomes of those services. Right now, this is just information so that everyone is fully informed about where those services, where those services are. Um, so the, the actual spokes or providers were the ones that, that said, I can serve in, in this level of school or I can provide this level at this school. Um, so I would guess more to come, but definitely this is where the spoke said that they could provide the services. But we, I think I did say, we do know we need more at the, at the secondary level and we have to prioritize that. We'll go to Ms. Chika Kalu and then Ms. Hen. Okay, so Ms. Frimpong actually asked my question, but that brought up one other topic that I think we wanted to highlight. So for students who are, like, who are expressing more alarming issues, outside of immediate and like crisis support, is there any direct link or pathway for students to be referred to their school psychologist if they don't have the privilege of having additional referrals, especially if they don't have the strongest home support? If, because that is the unfortunate truth that not, as Ms. Frempong said, parental involvement dwindles as they get higher. So for students in high schools, do they have, will they have that support or referral to their school psychologist to receive in-person support from counselors outside of talk space? Absolutely, so student support services, the one slide that I started with, um, really describes what student support consists of. So there's mental health services, there's psychological services, counseling, social work, um, and of course we have our, our teaming process for SST and 504 for general ed, for general ed students. So when I, when I share all of that, that's the full team, and those are resources that are available at the school. Many times when students are distressed, there, there are a couple things that happen. Students can self-refer, and normally they reach out to the school counselor or the adult that they're most familiar with that they are seeking help from. Um, and from there, it's a conversation about what those resources look like. We're really going to have conversations to engage the student and really identify what is needed in this situation. Is it a school psychologist that they need support from? It absolutely could be, and that could be a resource that's available at the schoolhouse level. A lot of times it goes um, through the counselor because that, that the counseling office is known in every school, right? And so the, the students reach out there or the parent reaches out there, and that team works together if, if there's a concern that 
short term, we address that distress and it's maybe I'm taking a test and I'm really super uncomfortable and this has just riddled me with stress. Um, if it's that and it's brief solution and we kind of manage it and we move on, but if there's something more persistent and life happens, life happens to all of us and it goes on and on and on and we become in extreme distress, certainly we're gonna work with that student and keep the pulse on that student and then mobilize resources. And yes, we can refer in-house to resources that are in-house. We could refer to a partner that's in our schools that could provide mental health services. And then of course, we always have our community partners with a vast array of services that we can connect students and families with. But yes, there is a continuum um, and I'd love to share it at, at, with you for more info. Also, so just another like part to that. So if this student is using Talkspace and they haven't like reached out within their school community or with a trusted peer or adult, is there any way to like for a Talkspace to initiate that, I guess, point of contact within their school or would it only be through their parent given that they don't have a strong home support? So Talkspace can circle if there are, there are significant needs, but they are going to ask the student for permission to do that. Um, any, any time there are, there's treatment for mental health, they are going to ask the permission of the person receiving that um, if they can communicate back with the school to, ex to share that information. My experience has been that, that that does occur and that information is shared with permissions always. And that is consistent with a community provider as well, or if we as school-based uh, su support staff would share information, let's say, outside of school with a therapist that might be outside of school or, or emergency personnel. Um, so there's always permissions that have to be asked and then the information to be shared. Ms. Hinn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my question has to do with student behavior data, not necessarily discipline in nature, but for those behaviors, and Dr. Jones, I believe this question is for you, um, for those behaviors that don't necessarily result in an office referral, um, but that we might want to capture. And if we're talking about delivering personalized um, supports to students, the more data we have, the better, that could possibly trigger those interventions and those supports. Um, for instance, chronic, chronic tardiness um, might be an exa one example. Um, how are we capturing that data if not for office referrals? And is that something that's captured outside of this? So it doesn't result in an office referral. Um, we may previously have, have written those for that, but it's my understanding we're no longer, is my first part of that question, I know this is, a, I'm throwing a lot at you. Are we no longer writing those? And if not, how are we capturing um, that type of data that might point to an issue that we could possibly intervene and assist with providing those supports? So I'll get us started. And if I'm Dr. Rogers, because she knows the numbers, she can share some information with you. But we, we encourage, um, as we visit schools and we visit anywhere between four to five schools sometimes in a day, we, we encourage teams to use the office referral process because it creates documentation. And so long gone are the days of do not submit a referral because you're right, that is our available data. However, for times when office referrals are not necessarily used, that's why we rely very heavily on our instructional leadership teams to have conversations about what they know is happening within the schools. And that's comprised of administrators, that's comprised of counselors, that's comprised of teacher leaders in our four priority areas. And they really dig in and think about what is happening from a non-quantitative standpoint that's happening in real time with, um, with our students. I think someone referred to it earlier just around, yes, students can access technology, but what happens when you just look in the face of a student or you've noticed that Raquel has been repeatedly late and then there are extenuating circumstances that you have to move upon? We have attendance committees, as we've talked about. We have safety teams. We have ILTs. We are now coming together around this um, initiative of institutionalizing PLCs and meeting to discuss all types of data, including anecdotal notes around students to really get at exactly what you're saying so that no child in the proverbial kind of gets left behind. But this idea of not missing an opportunity 
to make change on, be, on behalf of students. So referrals are being used, but in cases where um, that is not necessarily the case, you still have teams meeting to discuss data. And then at the central office level, we are discussing and constantly discussing um, the data and the things that are happening that may have happened within the community that we need to kind of reach out to schools and say, are you aware of this pattern of behavior that's happening with our students? So we try to approach it internally, externally, but then also at the central office le level. And we look at student behavioral data um, at minimum monthly and then in our weekly check-ins as well. So is that, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that part of the professional learning that's taking place? To look at data, absolutely. That wide, um, to, uh, around referrals specifically? Because I've heard anecdotally the opposite. We don't write office referrals, and School X does more referrals than anyone else in your area, and we're told not to write them anymore. Again, anecdotally, so I want to make sure I'm understanding what our official you know, guidelines are. I'm we are still writing. I'm and Miss Hinges, Miss Hinges, take 20 more seconds if you have other questions because sure. the timer went off. Yep. Thank I'm you. not familiar with that, but I'll speak to I'll you. speak to that. Um, we have uh, really tried this past year to make it very clear around our expectations and that schools will be supported as long as you're following the code of conduct and, you know, Comar, et cetera. Um, one of the changes that's an going to occur with the school year 24-25 is the use of focus. Um, so we had a soft rollout, focus was optional, and that's what created some of these anecdotal stories that you heard about. Some people used it with fidelity, others didn't, others had internal tiers versus when you used it, some people had, um, they would compile triplicate copies of papers and have secretaries typing them in. Um, that's not good for a variety of reasons. What we've gone in and explored in Focus is Focus gives us the ability to send in a note to say that you sent an email to a parent that you were concerned about homework, you were concerned about behavior. For our work around chronic absenteeism, we're capturing uh, period attendance for our students and then the attendance teams are going to look at that. But in terms of other behaviors, communications, um, whether it's communication in writing, communication by the phone, um, or face-to-face, -face, our expectation is that we are all capturing that in focus because that also provides us the best opportunity to intervene as soon as possible. And as our students, as we have transient populations, move from school to school, a school doesn't have to spend a month or two months trying to piece together um, what the experience of that student has been. So that, that is an upgraded expectation. Um, so we can move away from anecdotal, um, you know, uh, stories about what is happening, what's not, and that we're all rooted in the facts of what are the experiences of the students in the building. So that, that that's a change for this upcoming year okay. in terms of how we're leveraging focus. Great. Thank you for that information. And just as a follow-up, that, that would be helpful to see in terms of the overall picture of school climate as well, not just on a particular student level, but understanding what what's happening with behaviors, not that just results in consequences per yep. se, but how are our students doing? When I think of that, I think holistically in terms of how are they doing? Are they meeting expectations? And that doesn't always result in, in a consequence. So. Absolutely. Thank and you. I think that's why we're presenting on safety and climate and bringing it together. So thank you. Thank you for your thank you. time. Dr. Savoy. Okay. Do you have in-house suspension? <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, the, it, it can be coined and termed um, Many, many things, but um, I, I, I guess I would say. Then sending the child. Home I would guess I would say yeah, whenever, whenever possible, depending on the again, based on what the code of conduct says and the range of um, the range of um, choices or options. Yes, we do employ opportunities for students to um, remain in school and then also receive social emotional support and conversations or discussions or follow-up that allows them to kind of um, get back into the learning environment as quickly as possible. But of course, that would have to be something that is allowable or permissible 
within the um, the code of conduct that gives us a range of a range of options and w in school suspension again the reason why I paused is because there's um, there's a traditional approach to that but then there's the approach that we like to use and we always like to make sure that if students are in school then they are doing things that make sense for them in schools as it relates to academic again social emotional support visiting the counselor um, making sure that they're getting um, the work and things that they they need to get done so we see it as providing them an opportunity to stay in school based on the range of options but then it comes with a plan of support that allows it to be a productive day for the student thank you so much thank you and I just have two questions about Zello um, so number one how can parents access their child's Zello profile or their career dreams or whatever it is they're doing in this platform. <laughs> Absolutely. So we are going through that process now. So there's a single point of, of uh, sign on. That's what I would say. And so what we have recently discovered is that um, while we want to make sure that parents have access and they can go through Schoology to get that access, we do have some parents who don't have emails on record. So we're really bolstering the communication about getting emails on record. So it really is going into Schoology. It's going through the platform. Um, you will see more and more information that's coming out. And we are going to be, I can't remember the date, I can get it. Uh, we will be doing a parent information session to support our parents in logging on if they're having difficulty. Uh, but, but it will go through your Schoology access. And then how are you ensuring that students are using the platform? Is this something that's happening during a specific period of the day, like during advisory or homeroom? Um, can you talk, us a, talk a little bit about that? So that's a great question because one of the things that, as I shared earlier, that we found out in stakeholder sessions was the need to be very consistent. And so what our school counselors will be doing is they will would will be going into classrooms. They do lessons on a monthly basis at the high school level. They will be working directly to support students in logging on to Zello. Um, but we also know this is that this is a partnership too. So we want to make sure that we're leveraging student time to access their Zello account and use their Zello account to explore all the possibilities. But we also want to take advantage of leveraging um, the content with our parents to support them in also accessing. So it's a, it's a conversation not just with your school counselor, but it's a shared conversation for the whole child between the school, the student, and the parent or caretaker. And then the last question, I know I said I had two, then I <laughs> thought of a third one. So I know the blueprint requires this career counseling and these individualized education plans for students. So how will Zello be incorporated into all of that? So the, the wonderful thing about um, Zello is that it does allow for students to complete surveys that really drive conversations about what are, where do our interests lie, right? And so the other part of that is when you find out where your interests lie, it's also exploring the courses. What are the courses that match that, that interest level? And so while in the blueprint they do talk about how do we set that pathway in motion, Counselors will be working within that school team with the teachers to talk about what is the plan forward for our students um, in thinking about what's accessible and where their interests lie. So it's not, nothing is independent. It works, it works together um, kind of harmoniously um, for students to really do the exploration but then have that plan for that pathway forward. Any, thank you, any other questions? can tell there's a lot of interest in this. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on career and technical education and apprenticeships. And for that, I call on Dr. Di Donato. And team. Chair Booker Dwyer, Vice Chair Pumphrey, and Dr. Rogers, and members of the board. Tonight, I have with me, who you've already met, Navita Paro. She's our coordinator of college career and techno technical education, and Alicia Fells, and they're going to share some important information with you as it relates to CTE. Hello 
the game. <laughs> I think it's like the next one. So, um, Maryland State's the College and Career Readiness Pillar sets a new CCR standard that prepares graduates for success in college and the workforce by ensuring that they have the knowledge and skills to complete entry-level credit-bearing college courses and work in high-wage and high-demand industries. BCPS CTE is preparing students to be college and career ready by collaborating with core areas, providing technical content, and skill building to be aligned with CCR and meet industry needs. The CTE office has worked to create a five-year strategic plan with goals through 2028. The CTE staff has grown to include 25 career navigators to meet the goals of career exploration. As with all BCPS, the quality of CTE instruction is an has an emphasis to ensure effective teaching, learning, and program quality. Our teachers and programs will continue to undergo the accreditation process as required to provide certifications as well as continue to maintain our program advisory councils for all programs. CTE will continue to review demographic data and analyze root causes for enrollment and non-enrollment with work and work with schools and the magnet office regarding participation. In addition to career exploration for all, for all via blueprint, once students have enrolled in our CTE programs, we will continue to provide industry access via internships and partnerships within our communities. MSCE established three pathways to prepare students for success after graduation, yeah. including completing an apprenticeship, meeting CTE qualification, and industry certification. MSCE has also established the goal of 45% of students meeting the criteria for one of the pathways by 2031. Data from the graduating grade 12 students from 22-23 were analyzed. The annual increase was calculated to be 2% to meet the 45% benchmark by 2031 as set by MSDE. The data on the next two slides represents industry earned industry credentials or certificates as well as apprenticeships that have been completed by BCPS students exiting grade 12 in school year 22-23 that were enrolled in a CTE program. School year 23-24 data is not yet available. Currently we have, or we had in 22-23, over 7,000 students enrolled in the CTE program. 70% of those students earned an industry credential or certificate. Of the students that attained a credential, 52% of the students were black, 60% were Hispanic, 67% of, of them were multiracial, and 88% of white, student, white CTE students earned an industry credential or certificate. Of the students that attained a credential, we had 89% females and 47% of males that earned the credential as well. On the next slide, you'll see some apprenticeship demographics data. We are extremely excited that the male to female ratio is nearly even at 51 and 49%. Our uh, race demographics are also evenly distributed with 42% white, 35% black, and 23% other, including Asian, Hispanic, and multiple races. The apprenticeship data represents 77 students who completed the Apprenticeship Maryland program. The students completed a course related to their apprenticeship either from the apprenticeship provider, BCPS, and in some cases, CCBC. The students then completed at least 450 hours of on-the-job training. Our apprenticeship program is an exciting program that has grown over the past few years. Um, we began our, or we had our first graduates of our apprenticeship program in 2021, and there were four. They were from our electrical program. And in 2022, we increased that to nine, again in the traditionally apprentice trades. In 2023, we had 77 graduates from a wide range of fields. And in 2024, we had 162 youth apprentices who participated in the program with 100 of them completing. Many of the 62 who did not complete were juniors. And so they're continuing and will complete this year. Um, there's a, a stat on the slide that I want to really point out. Um, Baltimore County Public Schools really is the beginning of workforce development. So in the 23-24 school year, we had 100 Apprenticeship Maryland students who worked 
59,844 hours, earning more than $900,000 contributing to the local workforce. So that's definitely something that we are proud of. A youth apprenticeship can begin at the age of 16. Um, apprenticeships include the completion of related instruction in an area in which the student is interested, and then 450 hours of work-based learning with pay assisted by a Department of Labor approved mentor. Apprenticeships um, have the goal, of course, of advanced standing when students enter continuing education after they leave BCPS, um, creating a path to employment after graduation. Our apprenticeship program began with traditional trades because that those trades were comfortable with that structure, but we have since expanded to non-traditional fields, including areas um, such as accounting, cybersecurity, and child care. So truly, now most um, fields are apprenticeable if we can find an employer who will be willing to take a student. Our largest youth apprenticeship provider in Maryland is NSA. And last year, BCPS had 14 students who participated with NSA. And many of those students will continue in employment after graduation. Many of them truly are set for a career for life once they are um, in that position. Um, we're not quite sure what our NSA numbers look like for this year, but we expect to have that soon as we school year. Um, at this point, in going into the school year, we have 64 apprentices now. And that number will, of course, grow as we settle into the school year and settle into more placements. But you can see in the data there that um, summer last year we had 43. So we are well ahead of where we were. And we are expecting to exceed the number of 162 from last year also. Um, in the slide, there's a picture of um, students at Maryland Auto Insurance. Again, this is a non-traditional apprenticeship that we've used as an example here, and there's a story linked there um, from the communications office. And Maryland Insurance was a, a group that we worked with to truly work to develop out a non-traditional apprenticeship. We had our first placement there last year. That student has graduated and is continuing to work at Maryland Insurance as she's continuing in college. And Maryland Insurance is now taking their second BCPS student who is pictured in the story there, um, who will be working, spent the summer working with them and will be continuing with them through the school year. And then I'm proud to say that BCPS will also be placing um, at least 30 students within the system in several departments within BCPS, including DOIT, communications, transportation, and of course in our classrooms. This is part of our Grow Our Own building a pipeline into employment in BCPS. In addition to the apprenticeships, we have our traditional CTE programs. We also, as we talked about earlier, have the industry recognized credentials and we just wanted to give you a snapshot of some of the credentials that our students are obtaining um, and through our normal CTE programs. Um, they are TSAs also, we, they're called technical skill assessments or attainment. Those are our OSHAs, our, cert, um, our CPRs, our first aid. Those are not industry recognized certifications, but we are very aware that those are the things that they need to go to the apprenticeship. So if a student is doing an apprenticeship on a construction site, they will need to have their OSHA, um, OSHA t at least OSHA 10 card, sometimes OSHA 30 but they need to have those things so we make sure that those are available for our students as well. Um, dental certifications are an example. We have infection control, radiation, just to give you just a little bit of the things that we do. Those are required in the dental office for our students to do apprenticeships there. We offer remote pilot's license and private pilot exams, which is a partnership between BCPS and CCB. It is the official certification of our aviation programs and those are at Kenwood and Hereford High School. We also have Autodesk certifications, which are available through our engineering and architecture programs, which are throughout the county. So this slide gives a snapshot of the different industries, um, showing a strong variety of industries where our apprentices have participated. 
Um, we have many industries represented, including agriculture, um, but the, m the largest bar there represents our students who are in education. So all of this is possible through the partnerships um, that we're building to engage students and the community to participate and support our program. Um, as have, has been mentioned, we have 25 career navigators who began this year, July 1st. We have one assigned to each high school to work with students, staff, and the community. We have a picture here of um, the summer training that career navigators and work-based learning coordinators went through um, in partnership with the Baltimore County Department of Economic and Workforce Development and CCBC. And the navigators will be working with our community school facilitators, with our transition transition facilitators and our college and career counselors to ensure that all students, all students have a pathway to achieve their goals after they graduate. Um, this is in partnership with Baltimore County government through the Department of Workforce Development um, and the partnership we have with them is to support the work of the navigators but to bring partnerships um, from businesses to support education in Baltimore County. We also have a partnership with CCBC, which is about more than dual enrollment, which is an important part of our um, program. But we also use CCBC for related instruction. For example, we had a student this year who wanted to apprentice in a childcare um, pathway, and um, she was not in a school where our teacher academy program was offered, so she took child development at CCBC, and then um, she apprenticed with Celebrate and she was able to um, complete her training. We also have a partnership with Junior Achievement, and we have a CTE specialist who is working directly with Junior Achievement to forge the partnership and experiences for BCPS students in grades four and seven, and this allows us to introduce um, career development at the elementary level and to continue that discussion in the middle school, which then leads into the work that the career navigators are doing with them at the high school. And another important um, partner that really has developed this year is the Maryland Apprenticeship Connector. And that is a group that is working with MSDE to connect businesses to school systems and programs um, to make sure that we're um, attracting the businesses that are required to increase our apprenticeship opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present this information. We're excited to continue the evolution of CTE as blueprint and all the wonderful things that we've been doing for quite a while actually. Uh, we just rename it a lot of times. <laughs> so um, we, we are just thankful to be able to present this and show you how we connect the many parts of education and move students towards success after BCPS. Thank you, that was a wonderful presentation. Any questions from board members? Ms. Frimpong. Yes, this was a wonderful presentation and also kudos to something that you guys do in the spring, which is that celebration of the achievements of the CTE students. Thank you. Um, I was able thank to you. attend that and <laughs> it's you. wonderful. Yeah. That means a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so my question, and it, it's kind of going back to I think what I was trying to get to earlier, and you did mention it about one of the students, but like what does happen if there's a student who has that interest and it's not at their school? Um, or like even, for example, what I heard the Kenwood Hereford example for, um, I think it was the private pi pilot. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what if we want to get it down in Lansdowne or Catonsville? How do these students, how are they going to be able to take advantage of these opportunities as well? Well, actually, that's the um, reason for apprenticeship. <laughs> the, the purpose of apprenticeship is that if you don't have it in your building, you can then go to another program. This program is one course, and then you can apprentice the rest of it. So it's still four credits. It's still an amazing program. The only part is, Alicia will give you some more, <laughs> is that um, you have to find a partner, you have to find the related instruction, as, she, as, you, as you heard about Celebrate, that student. But those are the programs for the students that don't have it in their building. So we do have to take those partners through a Department of Labor approval process which is um, a bit time intensive. However, we do have support from the Department of Labor and from MSDE, from that Maryland Apprenticeship Connector and from our um, Apprenticeship Navigator at the Department of Labor 
who um, really makes the process pretty easy for them and they have to apply to the Maryland Apprenticeship Training Council and be approved. So what happens then sometimes is we have employers who we're using for internships, but then we see that the students can fulfill the um, hours required for um, an apprenticeship, which is 450, which is a more intense um, participation level. So we're able to then work with the employers to convince them to convert and apply to um, provide the apprenticeship. And then the intention really is that there's this pathway for students to continue after graduation, either with that same company or at least in the field and continuing the training related to that field after they graduate. But we do look for, um, back to how do we get into different areas, if a student in Lansdowne is interested in, let's say, aviation, mm -hmm. then we would look to some place like DWI or um, something in the area to see what is available there and would be closer for the student and would be a good fit for the student. And then we take a look to partners who can provide that related instruction. Maybe the employer can provide it. Maybe we can provide it through a program in BCPS or we're looking to CCBC or um, another provider to make sure that they have that related instruction so that they're ready and then they work with the mentor on the job for that 450 hours to really gain the skill that they need to be a, an entry level um, completer of the program. Which is also the beauty of the career navigator and the community school facilitators working together. That's right, fantastic work mm -hmm. and kudos to you guys as well. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Young. I just want a um, clarification. You, you said that the um, students will have a mentor from the Department of Labor, is that? No, their mentor is from the company who okay. then hires them. The students have to be hired by the company and the mentor is an employee of that company and they, ha they have to have one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Okay. But the students and the mentor are employees of the company who is then, the company is approved by the Department of Labor to provide that mentorship and that apprenticeship training. Okay, and do they get any, um, the student get any additional support from, you know, any teachers or from BCPS or is it mainly the mentor at the company? It's mainly the mentor at the company, but there's a work-based learning coordinator who is then working with the students to provide general workplace readiness skills and support and help them um, work through that that work experience, make sure that um, they understand what's expected of them on the job. The work-based learning coordinator is also working with them to reflect on their experiences so they can consider, um, is this a good fit for me? Uh, what am I doing well? Where do I need to improve? How am I going to be a good employee moving forward into this pathway? And to make sure they understand things like, what does advancement look like within this career field? So that they're not just entering an entry level, but they have a pathway to move forward um, in life. But then the work-based learning coordinator is also evaluating them and working with the mentor then to coordinate and provide support for um, workplace readiness. And ensuring that they're given meaningful tasks. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, this is, <laughs> this is not getting coffee and making copies, exactly. right? <laughs> that's, that's what the work-based learning coordinator is there to do. Um, and you know, we have kids out in all different fields, if you look. So the work-based learning coordinator is certainly not an expert in all of those fields, but they are trained in um, workplace safety and youth employment law and helping students navigate the workplace um, and the workforce and that, that career pathway. I didn't want to say get coffee and donuts, <laughs> but <laughs> okay, yes, Th yeah. thank you. That's a common perception in internship, it's okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you so much for this presentation. I am looking forward to the day when all of our students graduate with a diploma and an industry credential and that 450 hours of apprenticeship <laughs> um, <laughs> experience. So in Baltimore County employers, if, um, if you're not already signed up to provide apprenticeship opportunities for our students, um, please go through the process with the Department of Labor because we need to build our workforce. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is information. And in this list, you'll find the June 3rd meeting of the Southeast Area Advisory Council minutes. 
uh, the superintendent's rule 5410 school counseling services, uh, the policy review committee meeting dates, and they are also posted online with the other committee dates, the quarter four audit report, and um, the two, two items um, included and the next two items include the revised superintendent's rules, 5610 and 6600. The next item on the agenda is board member comments and agenda setting. I'll start with Mr. Young. I'm gonna thank all of our uh, staff members for the wonderful presentations tonight. Um, thank you for the hard work that you've put in on that. Um, the I have no other board member comments, but the next building and contracts committee meeting is going to be Monday, September 9th. Thank you. Ms. Dominowski. I have no comments tonight. Thank you. Ms. Hinn. Thank you. Um, I would appreciate an update on the work that was done on grading and reporting. Um, if the superintendent could provide a brief update on that. Um, that was a bullet on the update tonight that work went into that and we should expect to see some changes for this year. So if we could get an update on what those changes are. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Ms. Grimpong. Um, since our next board meeting is not until the 20th, after the first day of school, just want to send warm wishes to all of our uh, parents, students, teachers, educators, and support staff for a great first day of the 2024-2025 school year. Ms. Pumphrey. I have nothing, thank you. Ms. Tika Kalu. Um, I don't really have a comment, but as Ms. Frempong said, I'm wishing all of my fellow students <laughs> an exciting first day. I know some of them are weary to return, but I am wishing you guys the best of luck for the 24 to 25 school year. And also thank you to everyone today who just presented and spoke and for your dedications. Have a great evening. Ms. Teleski. Yep. Best wishes for everybody that's back to school in a week and a half. Dr. Savoy. I enjoyed all of the presentations and I'm looking forward to a great school year. Mr. McMillian. No, thank you. Ms. Harvey. I have nothing, thank you. Thank you, and, and I have nothing at this time either. So the last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held Tuesday, August 27th, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight. The meeting is now adjourned.